going live now. We're going live. The, the, there's a Zoom watermark on the live stream. That's slightly disappointing, but uh, oh well, we'll make do. So, okay, it's compress it like an idiot. Live, we're live. This is live in real time. Live, we're all alive. This is live. We're live. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Great. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. Uh, our next, next just chimed in as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Compress It Like an Idiot live on YouTube. Um, what is this about? Well, as some of you may remember, in the pandemic of 2020, do you remember that? Does everyone remember that pandemic that we had? I forgot all about it. You've forgotten all about it. Well, um, <laughs> on purpose. I, I, yes. I have <laughs> forgotten all about it. And as I was thinking uh, of an idea for an episode, I thought, why don't I go back through... Um, all it, the, I, I did this thing called More Kicks Than Friends. Do you remember that? It was like the coolest thing on YouTube for about four months. <laughs> everyone, everyone remember that? So oh, cool. It has to be a real festival one day for sure. Yes, that's that's the plan in the back of my head. But um, basically, it was, a, it was a weekly stream every Saturday for 20 weeks during 2020. And I, 20 weeks in 2020, I've just realized the link up there with numbers, magic numbers. Um, and so basically, I invited loads of people from all, all over the world to record little performances and send them to me. And then I would stream them uh, live on my YouTube channel, like a kind of music TV show. And I thought, what if I could invite some of you back and we could talk about like your live setups and maybe you could like give us like some rundowns of like either what you were doing then or what you're doing now and like how you approach like performing live because we're all performing artists in that. And um, you, you guys were the first ones I sort of plucked from my memory because there were so many to choose from. There were 80 acts and I was like, oh, I can't remember all of them. So, so here you all are. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks awesome. for having us. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, thanks. And who uh, wants to go first? <laughs> I see Chelsea's stuff right there. Oh, she volunteers. Okay. <laughs> Marie, you want to go first? Sure. Just before you just just before you do, um, happy birthday. Thank you. Everyone, let's, let's I'm gonna go. sing oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, um, if you can, maybe you could just talk about what you're doing like with performing, I guess, live now these days and like how you approach it, what equipment you're using, if you can sort of show us around. I'll switch to speak of you. Maybe that would work. Yeah, I, um, so doing the virtual stuff was great because you can be in your studio and you can use everything that you have in your studio. But then when you go live, especially with the modular stuff, or I guess with like any hardware, you kind of have to figure out like, what are you going to take with you? So you, I mean, for me, like I had to whittle it down for my live stuff, like out in the real world. Um, so usually I'll, I took, I'm going to switch my camera. So I've been taking just one of my systems with me and like it involves doing way too much work with taking things out and putting things back and um it really depends on like what i'm feeling like what i'll put into the system but right now like our whole studio is a mess but i've got the three modular cases and like one is all verbose which well, I don't welcome really... to verbose family <laughs> uh -huh. i have a big one too <laughs> it's great i mean it sounds so good but yeah just like various things so like the middle one is like a techno system and then this one is like the sound design system and then the verbose system so not familiar with the verbose stuff it's verbose is really good stuff yeah it sounds really nice oh. I, yes, I don't have any but i love it it's like the person that founded the company um we used to work for Bukla, so it's really Bukla inspired. Yeah, the uh the dials look reminiscent yeah. of Bukla. So you sort of compartmentalized the setup into three separate approaches. Yeah. So, so when you when you go out and play live, are you literally just taking one of those sections with you 
depending on the type of show that you want to do, whether it's the ambient one or the techno one or the sound yeah. one or whatever. But it never, but it never turns out that I keep the same stuff in the case. It's always like, well, I need to switch something out. So it just ends up with me like taking it apart and then like putting new stuff in and um, depending on like how I'm feeling mood wise. So like I'll have the systems at home, but I don't really keep them that way when I go out, if that makes sense. So yeah, I so like you sort of adapt to depending yeah. to. And so like, is that does that work out quite well for you? Because to me, that sounds like a bit of a fuss. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Might be a little bit like, oh, I've got to take that out. I've got to put that in there. I've got to put it. I've got to build it all again. And but you maybe you're okay with that. I mean, I guess sometimes I'm in the mood to do it. So it's like I'm going to take this part, and then when I do it, I can dust inside, and it gets really, really dusty, like unbelievably dusty for some reason. Yeah. So it gives me an excuse to clean it. Yeah, cool. And so do you kind of like um, patch everything before you go to the show or do you patch it when you get there? Or is it sort of, do you go there with nothing patched at all? Or how do you, because it's it, it's like an all modular setup, right? Yeah, yeah. So I patch it before the show, just so I'm not like on stage fumbling around. And um, people are just like listening to a drone for, I don't know, however long. So yeah, I patch it up, but then I rehearse it. And then kind of, I feel like the longer my set is, the more I get into it. And the more I kind of, you know, do more uh, improv with it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, fantastic. And so, um, what, what when was like the the last sort of live thing that you did in sort of in real life as it were rather than a virtual one because we're all kind of going back to normal now yeah actually did a live show at a cider house it was really cute um in dc and that was like two weeks ago right okay um, and i'm bringing my whole giant modular system i brought my mpc and then like um complement system that was a 104 hp so like the complement just had effects and modulation in it to run the mpc through right okay yeah so um is there is it important for you to have like a little bit of a, of a sort of as a bit of stability in a system or are you happy to sort of turn up with it all kind of maybe there's maybe the potential for it to all kind of go wrong <laughs> or it, can you see what I mean? Like you're kind of happy for, 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 to take these risks or do you kind of need something like solid in the setup? I, so like, I feel like the MPC was kind of a risk because I didn't know what that was going to sound like with the live system. And I didn't like that risk because I don't feel like it sounded very good. Just if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that whole thing about risk I was getting at was when I was doing some modular shows before the pandemic, um, I was patching it all kind of the night before closing the lid, putting it in the boot of the car, getting to the gig, doing a sound check and just kind of going, I can't remember what any of this does. How on <laughs> earth am I meant to do 45 minutes now or 30 minutes? And, and, and pretty much the set would be me just trying to remember why i thought this what was a good idea yesterday <laughs> you know, why, why did i think that this made sense yesterday now it just uh, nothing works because why like one attenu attenuator has yeah. been nudged slightly in the car by a wire and the whole thing's thrown off so you know i kind of thought yeah this is going to be really risky and it's all going to be free and improvised and then i came out of it thinking like and, and i would record i would record them as well and listen to them on the way home and go these kind of suck this is quite bad. So, and with that, I've kind of decided that maybe I need to take a bit of an approach where I don't want to say safety net, but there's something there that I can kind of fall back on. If, if things are going wrong, I can just kind of flick something and there's like something solid that, you know, I can have going whilst I reorientate myself, as it were. I feel like maybe I should do that. Like, I haven't thought of that, but I feel like that's a really good idea just like maybe have something else there maybe a drum machine would be good 
Well, I mean, if you're concerned about it, I mean, you know, I don't want to for you to suddenly start feeling concerned about things you've never been concerned about. But, um, you know, like it, if it doesn't bother you, then it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're able to sort of navigate these things, then like fair play. I'm just terrible at it. Really, really poor at it, especially if I'm doing things that are quite beaty. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know why, like the modular, I don't know why I like jive with the modular stuff so much. It's just like, it's such a mess. I don't organize the wires. I'm pretty sure that's like what my brain looks like um so maybe it's just like i'm familiar with it because that's just my mental state <laughs> yeah 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 that's fine. and people kind of don't really like laptops do they <laughs> i do well i do too but some people some people don't some people see a laptop and they go oh no what a laptop but then they see some wires and they go this is going to be interesting because there's wires <laughs> and shit and I mean, like, a... the more wires, the more confused people are, but then the less wires, like, with the laptop, the they feel like they're getting gypped or something. Yeah, 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 sure. It's just yeah. the same. Yeah, well, it's it's tricky, isn't it? And this is sort of something that I think we could, you know, talk about a lot because, you know, electronic music performance, whilst it's sort of um, been normalized perhaps in the last certainly in the last decade, perhaps even slightly longer, it's still very much in its infancy as an, as a performance art, you know, and yep. there's still going to be a little, uh, there's still going to be a bit of that thing out there of people going, you know, this isn't really music, is it? Someone just turning knobs and, and frowning at me bits of metal, you know, like it, it's, it's not really, it's not really art, is it? And, you know, I think whatever, I don't care what those people think, but I think for, for, for people who want to do a performance, um it's kind of a bit of a concern is that like oh how how do i make this compelling both for myself and for for the audience and even though when i've done modular shows as i said they were kind of a little bit of a sort of crisis like navigating a, a sort of you know like a spilt meal or something it was at least at least that was kind of like i was clearly involved in what was going on because it's like you know oh shit i've got to somehow work out what's going on and then by the time i've worked out the show's over so <laughs> I suppose yeah. it's kind of like watching someone solve a puzzle. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, it's I mean, th th this maybe there's slightly more romantic ways of saying us like navigating the journey, you know, going on a journey and like, you know, it's not really about, it's not really about w what you find. It's just about how you get there or, you know. Yeah. It depends on which scene you are, <laughs> which, which kind of people you're uh, at the show, you know. It's like a, like mental people would be like, yes, it's important that uh, you struggle a bit, and uh, we, we we like to watch you struggle. Or uh, other would be like, this is noise, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that guy think he's doing? <laughs> so yeah, I, I, mean, I think it's all audience too. You just kind of got to read who's there, and if you're, you know. I don't know if they're enjoying it, your chaos and your mess, and you just go with it. Yeah, yeah, cool. And so, like, you're you're kind of doing quite a lot of beaty stuff because I've I've seen clips on Instagram, and uh, you're kind of really kind of hammering home the kick drum. And um, mm -hmm. again, again, that's sort of something that can give you a, a little bit of freedom to kind of go around that because th there's that sort of solid, there's that solid backbone there that you can kind of maintain people's attention with, but at the same time, kind of like be able to see where it can go yeah which is yeah. Kind of what's good about techno yeah i love it because that's like the glue that holds it together um especially you know the kick and the snare that holds it together and then you can kind of just like mess around around everything else um and i feel like there's a lot of stuff that i don't show like all the i mean obviously people aren't going to really show like the things that don't sound great um but I feel like with that, like the kick and the bass are the most important things um, in my tracks. And I think a lot of my tracks are really bass heavy because I have like a hard time hearing like really high frequencies. Like, I don't know why. Um, or so it's just like, I keep it really, really bass heavy. Yeah, and so what do you? What modules do you use to do that then? What's your uh -huh. what's your go to for kick and bass? So my kick, I usually use the BIA, 
Um, but I've been using the sample drum, the Erica Synth sample drum for kick, just like the various samples, kick samples I have on there. Um, and then for the bass, I mean, the Verbose Complex Oscillator is a great sounding bass, but a lot of times I'll go outside of the rack and I'll use uh, the MIDI Mini or the Pro 3. Those both sound really good as bass and they're really easy to hook up to the system. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is great. Has anyone got like any questions or anything? I do. Go on in. Um, uh, like, uh, so like, does temperature affect the, the the rig when you play somewhere with it? And also, isn't it really heavy to transport? And how do you like how do you deal with that? And yeah, those two questions really. So, uh, my husband is like extremely helpful, and that he helps to like actually carry things. So I really need <laughs> to get a live case with like a handle on it to like mm. make easier because like right now how it is is just like too cumbersome um so yeah it's like it's really heavy and it's really hard to get around um and then for temperature i i feel like it could but i haven't mm -hmm. like encountered an issue with it maybe it was like some analog oscillators yeah yeah, yeah. The, like the tuning I don't, I don't so really have any are analog, things. aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah, most of them, actually, the delay is uh, the delay is digital, and it's one of the modules that eat up the most in the everything I have. If you put your hands into it after mm -hmm. a few hours running, almost burn your finger. I don't know yeah. if it's not. It still works, but <laughs> yeah, some of slightly nervous. Um, so now that you have all of these modules, do you feel like you could uh, make music in other ways, like just sitting at a computer or with a guitar or a drum set now? So I don't know how to play the guitar, um, <laughs> but I started I started making music with the machine software on the computer mm -hmm. and I liked it, but I don't know if I would enjoy it as much now as I used to um after having like experience with the modular and the hardware synths and everything so i don't know i mean i i like the way that vsts sound like they're really clean so if you wanted to make something really cinematic i feel like i would want to use that but i'm not like itching to use it how did you get into modular in the first place um it was actually funny, like my husband, who we have a studio together and he makes music too. And he was really into guitars and he was, um, I remember like on YouTube, he was watching a modular synth demo and like, it made no sense. Like I, I was like, this is overly complicated, really expensive. Um, like, why would you want to make music with this stuff? Like, why are you interested in this? And I was just kind of giving him a hard time. Like, like what, like why, like, what's the point? And then, um, went to a local music store that actually had the stuff and tried to use it and couldn't figure it out. Um, just like, I didn't, the whole thing, it was like a foreign language because it didn't help that like the one system that we were trying to use was the make noise shared system. And like none of their symbols make any sense for people who are like, never used this before. They are quite so, cryptic, aren't they? The make noise. And the manuals are hard. The manuals are hard to read too. Yeah, it, it, it didn't it's make any sense. Good information though, the manuals, sorry. Mm -hmm. But like once, I guess, um, how did we get it into it? He just bought some, he sold a, a nice guitar and he bought some modules. Um, and then we kind of messed around with them. And I, I was just like making loops, like the same thing over and over. And uh, I kind of liked it a lot. So got more and I feel like once we got the drum modules, that was when I was like, okay, this is really cool. I want to do that. 
That was going to be my next question is how did you find out? Because modular can be anything. So a lot of people spend a lot of money going all over the place. So how did you sort of find your vibe, if you like? Um, I don't know. I, I, I That's a question I have um, a lot. I think about like, is my music like molded by what I have? Or did I mold what I have according to like the music that I make? And like, I feel like it's both. Mm. Like, I think um, used to, I used to have the Erica Sense techno system and I felt like that, I really jived with that. So like when we sold that, I got the, um, like a few of the modules that came in the techno system. So like, I knew that I wanted that sound, but then when I bought something like um, Acme's Castle, that I didn't know like if I was gonna really like that sound, but like I've made it fit into what I'm making. So it's, I feel like it's like a chicken and the egg kind of thing. I like that point around whether you're just doing it because that's the equipment you've got mm -hmm. or that's, we're going deep early here, like, because uh, <laughs> they can probably do an hour on that alone. But um, When are we gonna talk about guitars? <laughs> we're, we're not, Alex, stop, stop. <laughs> when I'm on my eighth beer. <laughs> Am I like a bit quiet? Someone's just said I'm quiet. A little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What can I do about that? How about now? Is this better? Yes. Okay. There you go. All right. Project. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to project. I want to mumble. <laughs> I want to mumble into the microphone. Yeah, Sorry. Carry on. Carry on. What you're saying, everyone. Sorry. So another thing with modular. Do you think it's plateaued in terms of the modules that are available? Because are there any interesting modules that you've seen come out? You know, in the last year or something. Or do you think it's kind of peaked? I don't know if it's peaked or if it's like nobody can get things anymore. Mm. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, it feels so niche. Like if the company and I was like doing like I don't know some kind of startup, I I feel like I wouldn't I wouldn't get into the stuff unless I felt really really strongly about it. So. I don't know. I don't want to say that it's peaked. I feel like it will have peaked once you see the modular stuff in like um, a BTS video or something. And then that that's it. It's over. What is mm -hmm. BTS? It's a BTS video. Like a like the, the Korean pop band. Mm. BTS. Oh, I'm not the, I'm, I don't know them. You know what I'm talking about? They they like nah. huge there's like 20 people in the group. I, I think maybe it rings a bell. You gonna... have not heard them or it's of really, them. It's Enjoy really your life. It's basically heard the term. It's and take so that and boy zone together with <laughs> girls allowed all in one white band, maybe. Sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. I Let's mean, go. I have are in that group because there's so many people. But, you know, like once it hits like super, super mainstream, like everybody you know yeah and then i'll feel like it's it's over and then where will you go from there i don't know <laughs> have you not thought that far I'll, ahead i haven't no i guess you'll have to go back to like acoustic music or something we'll go back to um bashing wood together yes with yeah. rock and, and bashing rocks and stuff like that uh, yeah, I was I, I, thinking about um, also quite a lot of stuff is um, quite difficult to find, but the stuff that is easier to find has kind of gone up in price. I, I was thinking of maybe switching out a few things in my setup and I thought, oh, I'd like to put a DPO in there. Went to go and look at this for a DPO. They're like 600 pounds. And I was like, oh, <laughs> they've gone up quite a bit. That's yeah, sure. gone up, I think. What's Here that? Is. Sorry. Modules. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, normally I kind of think, oh, maybe I won't make any changes. I'll just leave it for a bit. But... Yeah. How do we? Uh, Wise decision. About, uh, <laughs> how do you guys feel about VCV rack, and potentially as a tool for busting through that learning curve, if you don't really know about the stuff and are kind of curious. I would absolutely say if you're thinking about getting into modular, but you don't want to splash out the money, get yeah. get VCV and tinker mm -hmm. around. 
Sure yeah. thing, yeah. For sure. It's a good stuff to try. I mean, it's free, so why not? It's free and it works like in, uh, it works a VST, doesn't it? Can you run it inside? I yeah, think you have to pay for it yeah. since version two now. You have to pay That's for the paid one. The free yeah. one's just a standalone program. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, Nathan, definitely. you're a bit quiet, by the way. Yeah, me? I'm, I think I'm just going to go right on the microphone and knock off this pop filter. I'm going to do that too. <laughs> this is, this is honestly... The microphone's like, like we're presenting the Eurovision Song Contest. It's as, yeah. <laughs> this is Sorry, unfortunately as good as it gets. Um, and I also can't hear myself, so womp womp. Take one ear off, mate. Take one ear off. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody in the chat said that there's an act that had modular in Eurovision. Unfortunately, I'm in the United States and we don't have shows like that here. Um, so I'm not going to consider that a peak because Eurovision is actually good. We, we, we can stop in Europe, but only in Europe now. <laughs> it's it's a funny one. Right I, I, I missed Eurovision because we were actually shooting the first episode of this show. Um, oh, but I, I kept quiet about it. But uh, I have no idea what happened in Eurovision this yeah. year, but apparently yeah. England did quite well. I think they came second or something. They came right? second. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, um, okay. Well, I guess uh, we'll move on then, shall we? Wait, Thanks, wait, wait. Uh, Where can we get any of the music? Uh, yeah. What? Oh. Sorry. My music? Yeah, oh, where can we find the music? And then Nick has questions. I posted yeah. your Instagram in the chat on YouTube and encouraged okay. people to go and follow. Yeah, follow me. I post many, many times. Um, my music. Okay, so my music, Marie and Hedonia is on Bandcamp. Um, and then my group that I'm in with my husband and my friend Liv, um, Mismatch Lids, has a single coming out um, Friday. So we have our first single coming out. And I'm excited about that. It's pretty, the music is really good and it's funny. So Buy that shit. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can swear. Click the links I've posted in the chat. Um, I will. Was it? Did someone say there were more questions? Yeah, Nick has. Yeah. yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. So I actually wanted to ask two things. So first, how do you go about with your melodies? Like, do you sequencer arpeggiators? Like, what kind of things do you usually use and go for? And my second question is about like a, an arrangement when you're thinking about like a longer set like 45 mm. minutes so how do you think about arrangements how do you go about your set to kind of morph from one thing to another like how do you go about that i use my go-to live sequencer is the um endorphins ground control it's got the like um one like drum track with the eight gates and then three um, melodic tracks and it has a keyboard on it. So I like being able to kind of input the notes that way. Um, as for like thinking about an arrangement, um, I do try to make like as many different parts as possible and try to get better at the transitions, like fading different things in and not having everything going at the same time. Um, and I feel like playing live is so much different than like being in my basement and like actually being able to record stuff. Um, you know, I mean, you make a mistake, then like you can't go back and redo it. So just kind of getting better with going, um, doing different things on the fly. But I don't know. I don't feel like I have a, um, a formula for like the live arrangements just kind of like do i have enough stuff going on but do, that do I, you, sorry go ahead that i can do that for like 45 minutes right but do you kind of prepare your sets in a way like you you know what when is gonna play or do you just wiggle around and just come up with something on the fly so what's your usual i approach? i usually have like um if i'm supposed to play for like 20 minutes or whatever i'll have my phone timer and i'll kind of know like all right so yeah. let's try not to do the same thing for like five minutes because that kind of gets boring um but if i'm playing something and people are like dancing and jamming then i kind of notice let's not suddenly change everything so people you know stop dancing 
I don't know. It depends on where I'm at. If I'm just like kind of background music at a restaurant or something, then it'll be like very planned. But if I'm kind of going with like the mood and the atmosphere, then it's, I'm going to go with the mood and the atmosphere, I guess. That makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, also, anyone with a chemist castle in the box is a friend of mine. So. <laughs> uh, there is a question in the chat. Are you programming on the fly or tweaking? Um, live? Let's, let's assume it's live. The yeah. only thing that I tweak really because I don't want to make a bunch of like ugly sounds uh, would be the drums. I would tweak that live, but then notes wise, um, I'm not comfortable enough being like, let me change up this whole sequence if I haven't already planned it. Like the, the ground control, I like it because you can, every single track, so there's like four tracks, every single track, you can like mix and match them. So if you have the bass, like the bass can be different and then the lead can be different and then you can kind of switch them around. Like they're not all gonna change at the same time. Um, so you can kind of change up the sequences on the fly. Like it's not the same eight step sequence over and over for like 45 minutes. Um, but no, yeah, no, I don't really like program on the fly. I feel like I kind of stick to stick to what I practiced. I do the I do tweak the knobs though. The knobs are tweaked when I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of get things different. And heaven forbid if I tweak a frequency knob by accident, then that just just kills it. You don't want to suddenly tweak the frequency of your kick drum and up to like twenty thousand kilohertz and then Definitely. come back down and go oh was i there was i there oh, yeah. boo, 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 boo. you might from yeah, personal experience that yes absolutely i speak from experience <laughs> <laughs> that actually that was actually one of the i mean that was kind of why i bought the 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 uh the the, the bia as well because it's just kind of like it's just kind of Okay, now I have a kick drum. That's fine. And for a long time, I was using the the Make Noise MMG just by like with the frequency all the way down, the resonance up, and just pinging it. You get a really nice kick out of that. But um, yeah, like to start with, I was sort of like, I'm going to be a real purist. I'm going to synthesize my own kick drum. This is this is mu this is electronic music. I need to synthesize everything. And then I did it, and I was like, no, I'm not doing this at a gig. I need a kick. I need like a kick. And so yeah, like you mentioned, like using the um, uh, the sample drum. Did you say? Mm -hmm. was, that, was that what you see? Yeah. So again, it's kind of that sort of um, something that, that I was sort of getting at is that like uh, um, having sort of something safe in there so that yeah. you can kind of, and reliable, I suppose it's like, if, if I trigger that, I'm going to get a nice sounding kick and a snare. And that's that like gives me the freedom to concentrate on other things. Cause yes. like, you don't want to worry about the kick really, do you? So. No, no, that shouldn't change too much. Yeah. Uh, can I ask something else with regards to your like effects chain? Do you prefer in like something in the Eurorack or do you go for pedals or something? What's your approach there? So since I'm like incredibly um, scatterbrained, um, if it's not in the rack, uh, I won't use it. I have, you know, my husband plays guitar and he has a wonderful pedal board and I feel like I should use it more. Um, but another thing about the pedal board is that it was like wired up professionally and you can't flip it around. Um, you know, I'll put, I'll do whatever type of effects chain. Um, you know, if it doesn't make sense, you know, I'll put delay first and I don't know, something else after the delay. Um, I just, I feel like in the rack, I can just kind of see everything and i like to kind of have everything um it feels like whole when you're using it like that for me i mean I, there are so many nice pedals out there that i want um i would it would be cool to incorporate it but for me i just like it better in the rack all right well <laughs> perhaps we'll move on then yeah 
perhaps we'll move on to Chelsea because I, I think maybe your your time's slightly limited on this show you mentioned. So oh, yeah. Um, luckily, uh, I have my little son out there and uh, walking with my boyfriend. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, hey. So, uh, uh, so, yeah, they went to get ice cream. So I have <laughs> a little bit of time. Um, uh, touching back on a few things that were mentioned, um, I don't think it's peaked at all yet. I think it's really explosive and that's great. Um, but it's definitely, if it's peaked, it's kind of plateau peaked because people still have fresh ideas. And uh, I just recorded a podcast yesterday with somebody I met at Superbooth uh, a few weeks ago, uh, brand new modules I hadn't seen before. And you know, they're digital, but very clever, like really, you know, so there's a lot of things that can still be done with digital and new ideas um, because it sounds great. And uh, plugins are amazing, like what they're emulating, like the new Arteria V Collection 9, emulating the sounds of the old synthesizers that are impossible to get. Um, you know, it's kind of like playing them, but in the box, but you're still playing them on your controller keyboard. So it's just like playing, almost like playing the real thing. Um, and then also having uh, help from your husband carrying things. I always had that problem. So this year I got a luggage dolly and I just strapped my synthesizer case, the shared system case to the, to the dolly and it just wheeled and it was much easier, but that's always a big problem. Um, you know, carrying all the equipment you want to bring to the show and you can't. So during the pandemic, it was really fun being able to use my drum machine at home. Cause I'll never, ever take it to a live gig. Um, I just like working with it at home. That's just me personally. I don't want to take my rhythm, the electron rhythm to, to a live show. I want to be completely free. And then also what you were saying about patching the night before, when I was at Superbooth just now, I patched it right at soundcheck. You know, the patch that I love to do all the time. I made sure that I had my case ready about two weeks before uh, going to the show you know, all everything screwed in where I wanted and stuff and practice some, but then just patching it a sound check is fine for me. And then a lot of experimentation and, and bumping the frequency uh, or changing it. And it doesn't, you know, it's not perfect, but it, it adds this character of imperfection and like, yeah. So people, some people can appreciate that, you know, but That's anyway. It. There's a certain, um, it's like, it's kind of weird, but sometimes there's a certain level of authenticity that comes from people making an un unintentional mistake on stage that they suddenly rescue. People kind of go, way. It's like when someone drops a beer glass and everyone goes, way. You know, <laughs> oh, you dropped a beer glass, way. But, you know, we'll tidy it up and then it'll be okay. There's something that, that, that like, it, it's a little bit, it's almost kind of like, um, you know, avant-garde electronica is, is, it's, it's easier to get away with that. Like you couldn't really get away with that in a blues band. Everyone would look at you and go, what did you do? You idiot. Why did you do that? Oh yeah. The rhythm. You're terrible. Yeah. But like when you're kind of, when you're sort of, um, I, I suppose there's something a bit jazz about it in that sense, like sort of just having the freedom. We've talked a lot about this, about the freedom in jazz and stuff like that. And like the, the Euro rack format kind of is almost sort of invites that it's almost kind of like, you know what? There aren't really mistakes actually. It could all be on purpose and it's fine. So, yeah, I, I think maybe you might have just answered a question about do you still patch from nothing? Do you do you still do the patch from nothing sets uh, like you did at Kimberly Beats in Cardiff? Is that what you were just talking about? Yeah, yes, that's what I did at Superbooth uh, just a few weeks ago. Just no, not a single thing plugged in, just practicing and always trying to remember. And then hitting that one what I avoid mainly is hitting the, the painful threshold, um, which I, I, I try to avoid that, you know, because once it starts to hurt, pff, turn it right back down, you know, or find where it's coming from and, and change it right away. That's the only thing that I really am totally against is like the threshold of pain. Cause I know what it feels like the super high frequencies that I don't like anything low is fine. I think. Yeah. So 
Yeah, well, so uh, Chelsea, you're obviously um, behind uh, the city. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, oh yeah. No, go on. Uh, you, you haven't shown- well, I was just going to talk a bit about CV freaks, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Because yeah. cause you're trying to put something together and uh, we've been chatting yeah. about it. Yeah, I hope that something in London can come together again because there was uh, 12 events in London. You know, you performed at two of them, I think. Yeah. And uh, I think you came a few others, but it was so good. And so many people came, people that I met in Europe to just exploring the different modular shops there and inviting people to come over and play. And so I thought the community in London was really, really good. And there's a lot of people there who, uh, you know, everybody approaches it differently and using a collage approach and learning about how everybody does things differently and seeing them all together. It's just amazing, you know, cause that's the creative freedom we have with this thing. That's probably why we like it so much. <laughs> Yeah, there's a huge there's a huge amount of subjectivity to it as well, isn't there? Everyone's kind of I mean, there are obviously sort of similar ways that we can all approach the same things, but what's good about it is that everyone's kind of got their own approach for whatever it is that they do, which is like there's always going to be something interesting to to sort of talk about with people or hear from people in terms of what they're doing. Which yeah. is cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So mine looks really strange because I use this collage approach. I find something that I really like and I use it for a long time. But this is the case I took to play at Super Booth. Um, so I basically use this as like my timing section over here, my peg. That's what I always use as my master clock most of the time. Then I multiply it here with this melt in the middle. And then I also clock uh, the Pam's new workout right here. So that way they're all going. Um, at the same time I think timing is important or sometimes I won't clock these two sides of the pig together I'll use one side for something at a different timing but sometimes you know you could make the choice if you want it all to be in time and this one also times things differently but this is the main timing area and as far as sequencing I just use a simple eight step nothing fancy and I, I use it often on just four uh four steps so that way it's like you change one note and then it, you know, changes something in the vibe or change the speed ever so slightly, like say I'll play 10 minutes in one speed and then change it a little bit and then go to a little bit faster or something like that. So I'll get a little bit faster throughout. And then by the end, I go back down to slow. So, uh, so right now I have the mixers are here. And this is using no computer right now. Um, it's just plugged directly in two mixers with one plugged into the other. So this one all controlled by one channel here. Whoops. This one is, uh, this controls the whole mixer there. One, yeah. And then, <clears throat> Two filters right next to each other. The three oscillators right next to each other and four. And I, only because I have so many because I really like to modulate them together because um, modulating them creates interesting rhythms in the voices and it creates like two voices in one, um, depending on what you do. And yeah, my kick all, sometimes I'll, I've been using that to create, you know, basic 4-4 or something. And my uh, noise, I always use as like a little snare, like you can hear it right now, it's the hi-hat. Where is it? Where is it? So right now the noise is just like that little hi-hat controlled at this speed. And a nice little kind of melody. because it's the only effect module that I use, the magneto. And it can be controlled. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the and the two VCAs to get rhythms. But yeah, you get the point. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, what what are you doing? Uh, what's that noise? There's a huge amount of noise. Oh. Is everyone else hearing that noise? Oh. Is that you? I think it's is it Chelsea? I don't. Yeah. So, sounded like something. Sounded like something changed in your sound set. Things that made everything quite loud. What oh, really? It? Sorry about that. You sound I like was... you're in a car. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. Oh, the you air go. conditioning, you know. Like <laughs> magic. Um, so, what are you what are you doing with the magneto? Because I, I I haven't got one, but from what I understand, it's kind of like a sort of multi track tape looper thing. But is that what you're using it for, or do you use it for for something else? I use it mainly just to run the sound through to apply the re spring reverb, and um, it has a really nice wet wet control so you can turn it up or down and then sometimes the looping if you have the button on loop it and you're recording it can record in, a sound inside and surprise you and play it back uh yeah it's really nice for creating ambient things yeah it's a beautiful module today. yeah magneto is probably the only one you you'll ever need if you have one aren't you the only module like effects wise I also noticed you haven't patched uh, this clock divisions there uh, on Magneto, and I actually found it fantastic. Because at first, when I started experimenting with it, I thought of it as an afterthought. You know, Strymon didn't have much experience with Eurorack, and I thought like they just slapped it in on top because they had just holes in there. But it it can create fantastic rhythms if you patch like some some percussion in it. It's like there are triplets. And there are all kinds of divisions coming out of it, so it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. There's so much it can do. I'm, I know. I'm just, go, I'm using it for the bare bones right now. I just, but yeah, the clock outs are really cool. It's nice when a module gives you a little sneaky extra thing that's actually incredibly useful. Like, I've got that on the, uh, oh, what's it called? The 4ms delay, the stereo delay thing. Um where like you can you you can ping the input to set the tempo of the um of the delays but there's actually a delay like trigger out so when you set the delay to a division it sends the division out of a of an output and you can obviously modulate the delay time so if you modulate the delay time you effectively modulate the clock division so sometimes I'm not even using it just as a delay. I'm just using it as a m modulating clock divider, which the, the is echo, brilliant. The echo phone from Make Noise does that as well. It was the first time, the first delay I used that did this trick, and it's awesome. Which one does when that? I, sorry. Oh, magic! <laughs> which module does that? Uh, the echo phone from uh, Make Noise. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have um, to get a, a little or, or to sort of discover that. Uh, Oh my god, it does that. That's really useful, and that's not what I bought it for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, yeah, any more questions? Anyone got any more questions? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Marie. Oh, the only thing I wanted to ask, like, this might be, like, a silly question, but, like, what was the first module that you bought, and do you still have it? Uh, I still have one here. I bought it well, the PEG I was one of the first ones I've been using since 2013. The Borg filter, also um, Maleco Borg filter, I bought when I first started it, and I still have it. Uh, the Dope for multi-mode filter, I still have, but it's not in this case. This uh, rotating clock divider is one of the first ones I got, also. So yeah, I have all the the ones that I started with. I I rarely part with things unless I really. I don't know. Lately, I've been trying more different things, but I really like to stick to to my, you know, bare bones where I came from. Yeah. It's a stop. So I noticed you use shared system, and I wonder if you if you started with complete system, or is it only the case you're you're using? This this uh, this case was a gift from my friend Jeremy, um, and it was That's like a birthday. Friend. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice gift uh, at, uh, I think it was Stevie Freak 6. He brought me a case as a birthday gift and a little cake. Yeah, so I've been using it since 2016. Um, 
it's uh, really good to have that melt in the middle, really useful. And it does work. Doesn't it work as a um, like an audio output as well? Isn't that yeah, kind it of? Does. It does do that. Yeah, yeah I never use it for that. No. <laughs> Input as well. You have a preamp on this, on one side and a line and headphone out on one side. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Use and the quite well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool. It's it's really good to have that in the middle. Um, but I have I have other cases, you know, I have another case here. This is another case I work on all the time. But working from home, you can use more stuff. So this is one I've been changing out. I love this and I wish I could have brought it, this one. And I just added in uh, this one, which is really awesome, which I used in another live performance thing for Modular World tomorrow. I used this one and that one together. And it sounds it sounds Does very it huh? was, it, was it raven that i saw Bird that's King? the raven yeah mm -hmm. yeah it, uh, amazing looking module and i also love the woodwork on this case oh yeah, yeah. nice Princess. case my friend did it. my friend in miami he beautiful kind of inlays you have one of the awesome. best friends yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Best friends. you can get <laughs> well i i look for them <laughs> what does does anyone else want to share their first module mine was brains Ooh. no braids <laughs> not brains braids braids. Yeah. brains is the behringer ripoff i mean braids seems it seems in retrospect it seems like a bit fisher pricey now by today's standards that one's great though it's great to start with yeah i mean it does every it's got everything you need really and then mm -hmm. i got a, then i got a maths and mm -hmm. uh yeah and that was how it. long before you sold it braids i've still got it I've still, still, still got my first ones. Actually, actually, I'm slightly lying because I, I got a mother 32 first. Mm. Um, whilst I was it waiting. Doesn't completely count. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah it doesn't, doesn't quite count. Well. That doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's that one's long gone. Um, but yeah, no, I've still got braids. Still got ma ma uh, maths, the woggle bug. They were the first three, and then clouds came along, and that was kind of almost enough, really. But it's never enough. No. <laughs> Yeah, I still have my first module as well. It's the Rubicon from uh, IntelliJ. I guess it's behind me somewhere, but you can't see it. But it's in the case right there. But uh, yeah, I just bought it and I was sequencing it from the uh, Analog 4 from Electron. And I was routing it back inside. And so basically, it was just like the oscillator being controlled by something else, the SCV, and going back into the filter of the Analog 4. And uh, at, at the start, just this was like, wow, it's awesome. <laughs> And then math and other stuff, and it, it was very good. But I still have it; it's still one of my favorite oscillators. A lot of people started with the Mother uh, Thirty Two. That's what I had. And the first actual proper modular built was the Tip Top Z Two O Four O, which is a, a filter to give a different sound. And I still keep that now. It's still one of the most meaty sounding filters that I've got. It's just really powerful. I think it's based on the old Prophet Five. I, I read mm. somewhere. But it's, it's just the way it overdrives. It's really meaty, and I've just always kept it. It's just a, such a fantastic, powerful sound. Yeah, the Z3000 sounded good. I got to play that in the beginning, too. I was like, oh, I always wanted to get one. Just never did. But I sure, if, if I did, I would have kept it. Anything tip-top, really. It's great. Do you guys sell modules you don't use? Or do you just stack Yes. Them? Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah. Uh, same here. I'm thinking of selling my uh, 4MS sampler if anyone wants it. <laughs> I think I might get rid of it. Great in the chat room. <laughs> you I can email him. What's that? Sorry. I was going to say you, your email is probably on the YouTube channel if people want to get in touch about it. Right? If anyone wants to buy my 4MS <laughs> stereo triggered sampler, I'll do it for two hundred and fifty-two hundred something for other. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, it's sort of it's it's a very nice sampler, and it's nice for really long samples. It's nice to sort of if if, if you've got like a really really nice um, sort of like drone or something happening, like a texture, and you wanna you don't want to kind of get rid of it. You can just record like ten minutes into the stereo triggered sampler, and then just bring it back later uh, um, as an audio file. But I think I I don't really. I've just bought a sixty four gig flash card for the Octatrack. I want to do it on there now. 
So I thought I might sell the sampler and, um, don't know, buy some analog oscillators or something. <laughs> don't know. So if anyone wants, wants to make me an offer, <laughs> make me an offer now. Well, not now. <laughs> I'm not in a rush, not in a huge Put it in the chat. Put your number in the chat. <laughs> Put it in the chat. You can get a hold of me somehow, I think. Uh, yeah. I were, there was something else I was thinking of, of maybe, or, or, well, I, I might sell my three distings and get a, get a disting EX, then I'll have two disting EXs. But, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'll buy Please. one of your... Where, where can we find your music? Oh, yeah, Hi. Chelsea. Where, where, yeah, let's, let's, link, let's link you up. What shall, what shall I link in the chat for you? Um, so, uh, Bandcamp, of course. I always put all my own releases on my Bandcamp. Uh, EdenGray.Bandcamp.com. And I put a new... Uh, four track EP with Triplicate Records this uh, month coming on June 22nd which I um, experimented with some different things on there um, but that's the newest release so that will I'll put a I'll put it in my link tree on my Instagram when the release is coming out in the next couple of weeks and uh, yeah so Instagram mainly uh, link tree the Oh, my YouTube, my podcast that I did yesterday with Nobula, that was really cool. So I'm trying to get more podcast guests, interview more modular manufacturers and artists too. So, yeah, so I hope uh, I'll, you know, get that off the ground more. It's something I started as the pandemic as well. Just like love talking about this stuff so much and, you know, hearing about people's ideas and music and stuff. So What's the uh, what's the YouTube uh, what's the YouTube name? Uh, that's um, it, the link is youtube.com. Here I'll put it. This this channel that's always I put it as CV Freaks because I call it the CV Freaks podcast because I mainly wanted to follow up on uh, those events and continue them. I'll just put it here. There you go. Can we make sure all the links are in, on YouTube, Ned? Yeah, I'll put. I'll um, when we're done, I'll go through and put everything in the uh, in the description. I think I've got the right one here. I'll put that in the in the YouTube chat. Oh, that's cool. You got Tom from Synth Anatomy in there. Hello, Tom. I saw him briefly at Super Booth on the last day. So much fun, and so sad I didn't get to say hi to Dave Smith this year. But man, so sad. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the CV uh, free, uh, the, the CV Freaks podcast is very good. I can confirm because I was on it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. Well, thanks, Chelsea. Anyone else got any more questions before we move on? Because we've got like three other people to get through. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Just uh, feel free to hang out. Um, who wants to go next then? Julian. Okay. Yeah. Julian, aka Stasma, the Jungle Christ. Just before you start, how is Bangface and Bolter? That was fucking awesome. Especially <laughs> Bangface was really the. I think it was the best one ever. I think it was my fourth, my fourth weekender. And I've played a few of the shows in London, but anyway, this year was. I suppose crazy. it was the first one since the pandemic, which was yeah. We, you could feel it. You could feel that. Also, it was bigger. There was more people. Because uh, for those who don't know Bankface, it's a, it's a festival in a sort of holiday camp. And uh, so the people, everyone has his own flat, basically. And you live in, like, you have roommates for the weekend and you share flats. And uh, it's a whole crazy mess. And this year, they added some uh, hotels from, uh, basically, I guess, the same owner than the, than the holiday camps. And so there was, like, I don't, I don't know how many people more than the usual, but you could feel that it was, like, way more busy and crazy than uh, than ever basically <laughs> all the rooms were packed all the time so, yeah it was really really good awesome cool yeah i'm uh, Balto, hoping, Balto. hoping to go one time yeah but balto was uh, very good as well a bit uh, a bit less uh, crowded i guess also because it's more daylight festival than the uh, bank phase being just an insane rave for four days <laughs> yeah and it's it's like a chalet festival that's what i would Mm. Describe it as everyone stays in caravans. Yeah, is it, or is it pontins? Yeah, 
Pontins, isn't yeah, it? it? Pontins, it doesn't mean Pontins caravans. yeah. It's more like small, <laughs> small flats. It used to be in caravans in, uh, in other locations before. Uh, I think the first one I played was actually 10 years ago. It was 2012. And uh, it was uh, in a, more in the south, like in, in Cornwall. So it's the one that FX Twin plays as well. And uh, yeah, this one was everyone has caravans. And, uh, but here it's more in the north, so everyone has a small flat with another flat on top. Lots of flats like this, lines. So it feels more more north for sure. <laughs> and everyone's going and raving in the swimming pool. Yes. Like Does anybody down. remember anybody remember Black Weekend? Yeah, I, I do. Never, but it seemed to be the same kind of things, yeah. So good. That was fun. Really fun. Did they start, actually, we were talking about it with some friends asking if there was still going on or have they just stopped after the pandemic or? I know? think, well, I, they, I went to one um, that was in the London Docklands in uh, 2012, which had an amazing lineup, but was a complete disaster. Oh boy. Um, and I think it might have sent them into administration because okay. I don't recall anything. I don't recall hearing anything about mm. Block Weekend or after that. 20, um, 2015 was the last one. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong then. Yeah. That was the only one I went to and it got shut down after two hours. Why? Oh, boy. What? Because so... <laughs> This is, this is quite a long story. I'll try and keep it short. But basically, they, they, they were doing it um, in London Docklands. They, 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 built, they were building this like new site and the site wasn't quite finished. So I'm not too sure what they were building there exactly, but they were redeveloping a part of London Docklands. And Hi. whilst... Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, mate. All right. I'm just telling a really boring story. Um, so they were redeveloping this part of London Docklands and a lot of the building work hadn't finished so we arrived at the festival and there was like it was kind of just like gravel and mud everywhere there was no grass there was nowhere to sit Um, and obviously there were tents and stuff and there was like one of the venues was in this like really old like navy boat it was really exciting they had like this amazing lineup they had like um I think they had Orteca, I think Square Pusher, um, Snoop Dogg, Richie Horton, <laughs> Steve Reich, um, just like this insanely brilliant lineup. And then um, I think like right into the beginning of Friday evening as, as Snoop Dogg's like coming on and everyone's starting to get a little bit cross because he's really late and everyone's thinking, oh, here's Snoop Dogg, he's being late or whatever. They just announced um, everyone needs to go home, the festival's cancelled. Okay. And uh, everyone was like, what? And there was this big uproar and, uh, you know, chaos ensues. And um, yeah, it was cancelled. And apparently, I think what happened was, is that I think this was the early days of like QR code ticketing systems where you, you didn't get a ticket. You get emailed a QR code and they'd scan it and let you in. And one of the QR codes just got leaked somewhere. And everyone was turning up with the same QR code. And they let them, they let in like hundreds of people who hadn't bought tickets and... It it was a it was a disaster, but it was fun. <laughs> disaster. <laughs> but, and it was a shame because it was just it was the most amazing like lineup I think. Say bye. Uh, Say bye. Uh, We're gonna jump off now. <laughs> okay. Bye. Nice everybody. to see you. Thanks for chatting with bye, us, Chelsea. Thank you for sharing. Cheers, you Chelsea. Bye, bye, mate. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um, yeah, so Julian, like uh, you played it, uh, more kicks than friends. Uh, oh, I can't remember which number. I can't remember any of the numbers. They all blur into sort of one dream. Yeah, but one big. Um, <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was. I've, Facebook gave me a memory today that I, this weekend would have been number thirteen, I think. Okay. Or maybe I can't remember, but um, I, I, yeah. I remember at all when uh, when it, when it was done actually. But uh, yeah, it was a good. It was a good one. I guess, I guess it was in a row where I was doing a lot of uh, online stuff, which uh, when the when the pandemic started, it was like I never do that. And in the end, as lots of uh, nice and uh, friendly people asked me to do it, I was like, okay, I'll do it. But uh, for me, it was weird playing in the studio, really, because most of the time I don't use I, uh, for my main project, which is Tasma, I don't use hardware, and. Uh, being like in the studio with just the controller and the laptop, being surrounded by hardware, 
feels weird. It felt weird anyway but on the moment. But uh, it was fun to do anyway. anyway. It was cool. Uh, yeah, that so was... I- um- that was definitely something that I was noticing in like to start with when I started approaching people was that there were some people who were who just weren't into the idea of kind of playing to no one, which I can appreciate. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know what, if it's, you know, if you're not up for that, it's fine. But um, yeah, uh, it was also c- quite exciting to sort of get this kind of quite uh, enthusiastic response from lots of people who were just like, yeah, I mean, I am basically ready to go. Why don't I just record twenty five minutes of whatever, and um, yeah. and that was kind of what made it um, exciting, certainly for me. Um, so yeah, maybe you could sort of talk us through a little bit about. I know that you're mad into the breakcore and yeah. um, and the hardcore yeah. sounds. What so are you like, kind of what are you up to these days when you play live? Uh, so basically, I have the same setup since actually a long time, and I've been working on it since since a long time. But uh, since I found it. I kept it. Uh, I don't have anything uh, wired up, so I can't make you listen to how it works. But I can show you the stuff that I use, which is first this uh, controller that I'm probably one of the few people on earth to have because I guess it was a complete failure and didn't sold. It's very hard to find. Uh, is it livid? Yeah, it's a livid block. Yeah. And uh, for, for me, it's basically the, the, the best uh, feature wise of the grid. Eight knobs, some faders. I mean, you, you can do quite a lot compared to the, the launch pad. Or, I started with the launch pad, basically. And uh, it does the same thing, but has a few controls. So you don't need two controllers, one with four knobs and extra. So for those who really want to get deep into what I do on, the, on live, maybe it's best to go check the video. I have, I've made some videos on my YouTube channel that explain everything. But basically, I use this to control live. As if, as if it was a launch pad or like a grid controller, so I can make a very long live set and scroll through it using those little things. So I can have like as many scenes as I want. And uh, I oh, basically I use it like each, each of those columns is a channel. And on the break part, as of course in the break call things, break beats are something important. I usually cut down lots of pieces of breaks on the on the break part so i can play them by hands like this and uh yeah tweak some effects in live and i also have this little guy the midi fighter 3d and uh if i want to use them in conjunction basically i have a few different pages set up one which is doing some just like ethics on the master like the classic retrigger flanger uh, cut time stretch stuff like this that are uh, usually I, I use mostly the uh, how it's called uh, the finger from a reactor that was made by yeah, Team yeah, Exile yeah. and a few other FX that I have mapped uh, in live and I also have one page which is like other breakbeats uh, all the slices of breakbeats that I can trigger from here and I use like this one as a crossfader between what's playing in the track. That I'm playing at the moment. So this is the normal drums, and here the drums that I have on this. So I can just flip like this and make a stupid breaks on the fly. And what, what I wanted with this basically was to, I, I like to say it like this, to be a punk band by myself, as I come from more from a punk and metal back, background. And uh, seeing people playing electronic music has always been something that sometimes you you're like, wow, the music is awesome, but the guy's just not doing anything that I can relate to, which is sometimes fine by me. I mean, I, I don't really care, but uh, I cared for my stuff and uh, I wanted to do something very live. And uh, it's a bit of a mess to set up uh, the, the way I do it. But once it's set up, I can show up live and just have fun for one or two hours and just be a complete idiot on stage smashing buttons and turning knobs and uh, people can basically see very easily what I'm doing because it's very live. I usually end up with my controller like this. There's lots of videos of me doing this, usually half naked because I go so nuts that I'm too hot and uh, end up without a shirt very quickly. And uh, yeah. Basically do you ever like my... play it like behind your head? Do you ever do that? No, I never tried. I once played it with my head actually like this 
<laughs> and the, 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 the show the day after, like, all fucked up here. That's fun. <laughs> nice. And, yeah, uh, so it, visceral. Yeah. Mosh, moshing, visceral, break core. Exactly. It's not that violent, actually, compared to others. But, uh, uh, I mean, I like the fact that it's something... Uh, especially when I play, I mean, I want it to be something uh, energetic and uh, yeah, very punk in the in the way it is done live. Basically, because I can I can really mess it up. I did sometimes. Yeah, I really leave my leave a lot of uh, yeah places to do mistakes. Basically, uh, I, I could make it very much much easier for myself, but I prefer not to. So I have to focus. And uh, sometimes, uh, as we said before. Even with this, you can sometimes make us weird mistakes. That sounds good, actually. Sometimes it's just like, oh, what have I done? What, what's this? Okay, let's do it again and make it like it was on purpose. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm sort of like starting to see a bit of a pattern because like, I, I like to have like a slight element of risk in like when I'm doing a, like a, a performance of sorts. And like, it's very interesting because, you know, again, I'm sort of going back to this kind of... Um, you know, I guess I'm sort of projecting my belief of what the the audience is thinking, and they're probably thinking, "Oh, this is just someone just pressing play and doing nothing." Um, and actually, maybe like for some of us as the performer, we're actually kind of thinking, "I need to have something there that actually I don't know what's going to happen." Um, yeah. You know, like and and you know, we've sort of mentioned like mistakes, happy accidents, or whatever, or or something happening in the moment that's like I wasn't expecting that, but it sounds good. I'm going to go with it. You know. Um, which is kind of interesting. If in some ways there's actually more to it than maybe your, you know, your band playing songs where they've planned it and rehearsed it meticulously, and uh, there's no sort of flexibility or fluctuation. You know, yeah. and obviously for improvised bands and jazz bands and certain types of bands, that's not the case. But for for most bands, it's kind of like, well, the drummer didn't come in. We're going to have to start again. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see these sort of uh, similarities that everyone's taking with how they're approaching these performances of like, oh, this could go wrong at any minute. It's sort of a nervous energy. Yeah, sure. It, it brings some, uh, it gives you adrenaline, I guess. Uh, I guess some people don't like that at all as well. But uh, if you like it, it's a good, uh, it's a good thrill. I mean, I, lo I, lo I love to play live because everything I do live is at least a part improvised. I mean, I can't really decide to go on one way or I can completely skip a track or decide to play one twice as long that it's supposed to be because people are really enjoying it. Or I'm not as free on the on the playlist as a D, that the DJ is, for example, because it's still quite planned in live. But uh, yeah, it's a bit fun. There's a question in the chat. I like it. <laughs> There's a question in the chat, which I'm going to attempt to read. Does anybody find it hard, frustrating when creating something that gets you in the fizzy bits, <laughs> but then you have to stop and slow down or stop or slow down to find some buried setting? Did I read that in a way that does that question just justice? Uh, yeah, I guess, I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I, if, I, if I understood well, it's just like you're like, oh, yeah. But uh, now I have to record it and you have to figure out sample rates and uh, stuff that all I didn't menu things to make it work. Is that what it mean? Uh -huh. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Like, I feel like it means like when you're playing live and something goes wrong, and you have to suddenly kind of stop what you're doing, being in the moment and figure out uh, what's going on. That's why I've got a couple of effects that I call my oh shit switches, where I can sort of Put that on and it'll sustain a note or do something weird so I can dig into what's going on. And then I keep counting my head and then I can bring back the oh shit switch and then I'm back and ready to rock. Yeah. That's really no, go, go. Uh, oh, I think, uh, sorry, Marie, we didn't catch what you said. You were cut out oh, by the I Zoom. Part. I was just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Validation. I like the oh shit switch idea. Um, yeah, I can, like, for, for me, I kind of just got like this sort of infinite reverb tail on a send that if something goes wrong, I just throw everything into this. <laughs> and then I can kind of go. Ugh. But uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've only done like two live sets this year and they were both very meticulously planned. It's been a while <laughs> since I did anything sort of loose, but I'd like to in, in, the, in the future, obviously. Um, yeah. So like, yeah, we should definitely like um, your YouTube channel is obviously 
very informative and you go into a lot of depth about Thanks. how you do your sound design and stuff and um actually yeah. the, the the one i did on the on the oh i oh i do the live sets was the first one i did the first video i did on youtube i guess as a proper tutorial and it was during the pandemic that i decided to start addressing those questions that people asked me a lot like how do you how do those bits of uh, guitar aero playing break beats and uh it was fun and i i re-watched it just because I was uh, showing it to a friend recently and uh, the sound is shit. My voice is shit on it. I have to redo it. <laughs> New stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you could feel that it was the first YouTube video I did. <laughs> yeah, man. Like I've got videos on there from 10 years ago where I'm talking into my iMac microphone. Yeah. And they're, <laughs> they're awful. That's the beauty of it though. It's the beauty of this. Oh, you know. There's a charm. Charm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's 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 the progression. Not charming. The progression. <laughs> not charming. It's shit. It's shit. It's shit. <laughs> it <is> shit. <laughs> For the one doing it, it's always horrible. For the other, yeah. it's charm, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's next for Stasma the Jungle Christ? Uh, the, I actually, I just slow down a bit right now. It happened that I had lots of show in a row, like I played in Australia then bank face then balter then berlin wow. uh, like each two weeks apart plus some teaching because i'm teaching model synth as well so uh, i was also doing a week of teaching in the middle so right now i'm just like oh. i have a yeah. few small shows going uh like uh, i'm playing for uh, like la fête de la musique in france which is like uh, on the 21st of june i guess it's a new a european thing now like uh, the music day or something, uh, and I'm playing as my with my other my other projects called called Repetitor, which is more uh, hardware acid based. I, I can actually show you the gear I use for this as well if you want. Yeah. I was playing at Bank Face as well with this. Uh, where are they? Two main ones for this setup. Uh, the Yocto, which is a, a yes. Trio Tree clone, like yeah. the first Trio Tree clone that was made, basically, I guess, uh, which is originally a DIY. I bought it from a friend, this one, and had it rehoused in, a, in this nice aluminum case. And the other one is this one, which oh, is nice. a, the Yocto, which is a, also a DIY uh, 808 clone. Uh, that I didn't build myself. I mean, uh, don't nev never leave me with soldering iron. I, just, I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I, still, I, still, I really need to figure out how to work with this, at least to repair some stuff. But uh, so basically, yeah, I have those two. Uh, I play. I start with like nothing on the yocto on the drum machine. Like I go like full, like lots of uh, blank pattern, and I just have lots of patterns that I like stored in the like the song mode of this thing. And uh, this, as it has some uh, CV outputs, I usually uh, take with me like a small, uh, small case like this, not with those modules though, but uh, like, yeah, a mix match of modules that I like on the moment in a small case uh, with the no cost as well. And so I send the CV out from the socks box to whatever modules, oscillators I have in the case. So they will play the same notes. I tune them usually one octave, like uh, each oscillator one octave below, uh, no, above the others. And I can trigger those though with the drum machine. Uh, because I don't use the gate from the Yocto because otherwise they would be playing the same thing all the time. Uh, at the same time, but I used uh, one of the trigger outs from the Yocto to trigger the envelopes of the modular parts. So I know I, can, I can't really um, fuck it up in the sequence wise, but having like the baseline running all the time from the Xbox box and having those little bits and weird things that comes from the modular around works really well. And I have lots of pedals as well. 
that I use to shape the sounds of uh, every part. But it's quite a, it's quite a simple setup compared to like the big modular thing. But it's also something that I can have a lot of fun, like just like jamming, like making patterns on the on the fly, tweaking knobs and stuff. It's really fun. Uh, I have fun. I guess, I guess I'm the kind of guy, as long as I have fun on stage, I can see that people have fun as well, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's very good, because I probably look like I'm having no fun at all when I'm doing my thing. I'm <laughs> standing there just looking at my screen going. Checking your emails. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I get that YouTube comment? <laughs> <laughs> I can just um, yeah, I can show you some of the pedals because they're quite important in the in the sound of this uh, of this setup. This, this is the the one that goes on the drum machine. So it's a Moog filter with a drive. So I always drive it at the beginning a little bit and usually at the end at max just to make it sound like. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, it, it sounds awesome on any, uh, basically anything, uh, and on any drum machine, or mostly. And uh, fun fact, those things now cost around like four, five, or six hundred euros or pounds second hand. And uh, when I bought it, it was still when they were manufactured, and I got it for like 150 euros or something. Wow. Which now seems incredible. Yeah. And th this this is also one of the brands that I recommend for everyone who likes distortion. This is awesome, especially on the trio tree. Also on anything, but uh, on the trio tree, it's very, 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 very good. What was that? What what you, oh, what, what was that? Sorry. Uh, it's the uh, the name. It's the. Uh, Electro, no, the custom electron fuzz CV because, yeah, it's a, it's a guitar pedal, but it has like mini jack ins because it's made to be used with synthesizer. And you have, you have CV over everything. And basically, wow. it's two fuzz, two fuzzes in a row with some mix controls and some feedback added and a view and a view meter, which is always awesome. <laughs> very, very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very nice. <laughs> sound better but it's it looks good and the last one that also that's also important in this uh setup is this very weird spring reverb that i got recently that's made for by a uh, game changer audio and uh it's like a the most over engineered spring reverb ever done basically <laughs> like if you like spring reverb and you like weird technology that makes a spring sound weird this is incredible. Sounds awesome. It's quite expensive, but you can probably also like throw it to a window and it will never break. It's extremely it. heavy. <laughs> and it might make quite a cool sound as well. If you yeah. throw it in. <laughs> like you, you might get like a King Tubby kind of. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. When you it's throw just, it against something. I, I use it quite a lot actually, just to like. <laughs> make yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The, the thunder thing. The th <laughs> <laughs> Decent, yeah. Anyone got any questions for uh, for Julian, either here or in the YouTube uh, I chat? I do. Yes, please. Go on then. Yes. Um, so, Julian, when you're doing like the break, when you're doing the, the finger uh, drumming, as it were, or triggering, um, it, are, are they like quantized, or are you having to do it in time? As it yes. were. Yes. I tried uh, at first. I tried to not not quantize anything. Mm. But at the t at like I I tempo, it's I felt it, it would it would need I, I would need to practice like so much to make it sound good mm -hmm. it didn't work the asshole basically. Mm. But uh, so what what's one of the cool thing with live is that you can decide which, uh, each clip uh, which quantization it has. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. The main the main quantize I, I think it's one by four. Like the, the the main thing, so I can like even a, a scene, a whole scene, I can like retrigger it to make like ba 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 ba. But all the, the small breaks, they are one eight, so I can like yeah. be faster on them. And okay, yeah, cool. basically that. Cool. But I've, yeah, yeah. I've tried yeah, the no the no quantization thing. Some people can pull it off, but it really, I guess you just need to. 
be doing it every day of your life for <laughs> 16 hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want, if you want to play this at 220 BPM, <laughs> oh, oh, can you do it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think live, live as well. It's always different, isn't it? And you're like your technique just changes when you're in front of an audience doing anything like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever sort of find yourself getting like kind of lost and you're sort of like, oh, I don't know where I am in the, in the measure. I'm going to have to start again or when you're no, working in like one eighth or something. We drive, uh, you know, n not, not often. I don't do that much things that aren't 4-4 actually. They are very complicated 4-4. Like there's lots happening in a weird way, yeah. but it's most, most of the time 4-4. The few tracks that I did like in 7-4 or stuff like this, uh, when I play them live, I have to focus for sure. Mm. I have to be like, okay, this is not one of the one of the easy ones. So I have to tap my foot and and be yeah. I have to focus a bit more. But yeah, it's been a while. I haven't fucked it up that much that it was noticeable. I guess. Or if I do, I always manage to make it sound like it was normal, like I did it on purpose. Usually, like uh, re-triggering some things and be like. <laughs> And start over <laughs> <laughs> and then perhaps maybe smash your head into the midi controller yeah of course <laughs> um it's a good way to distract people from the mistakes <laughs> yeah 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 he said hey everyone uh, just uh, ignore everything that's happening and look at this <laughs> <laughs> look there's blood now <laughs> <laughs> fantastic uh yeah well um Unless anyone else has any more questions, uh, we could maybe move on. If anyone's just tuned in, you're watching Compress It Like an Idiot on the Ned Rush YouTube channel. We're, and uh, this episode is about, we're having a bit of a More Kicks Than Friends reunion. I've invited people who performed in the now legendary TV show <laughs> of 2020 to come in and talk about uh, performing live and um, what they're doing with their setups and stuff. Let's maybe move on to Nate, who's been sitting very quietly in the corner. Oh, I don't. But I have some people coming over tonight, so I'm gonna head out. Nice. Bye. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of your birthday. Have a nice time. Thank you so much. Have a nice See you so later. Much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so my, my style, sitting quietly in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, you were on episode one. I remember. <laughs> I remember you were on episode one. I remember um, too. It was uh, it 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 was uh, it was exciting because I just sort of put this thing out. Just I just wrote to like some random people. Who do I know that does music? Oh, I know loads of people. Um, can you give me like twenty five minutes? And and you did, and it was awesome. Thank you. And I was like, wow, this could actually go somewhere. So you're kind of uh, you're kind of doing the live looping, I think. Yes. Uh, big time. Um, so yeah, bass guitar is my primary instrument. Um, let me just confirm you guys hear me just fine. I hear you. Loud, yeah. loud enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You're kind of quiet. Let me see. You know, I, I think I was thinking about what this problem might be. I, I, th I don't. You don't sound too quiet to me. But I have got a bit of compression on all of you. No, it sounds really quiet to me as well. Sorry. Okay. Let me see. Uh, yeah, bit yeah. Hello everyone. Is we this, are am I solving technical any problems. Louder? <laughs> not so much louder. How about this? Am I getting much louder? No. No, not at all. Uh, no, real perceivable effects. Some zoom settings or something. Yeah. Uh, womp womp. Sorry guys. That's all right. I know. I thought I was trying. I was trying to go through my Ableton set so I could do some screen sharing, but uh, uh, yeah. This is okay. this is tricky. This is new to me as well. So yeah, <laughs> you know we're okay. all going to learn things. Yep, okay. figuring it out as we go. You know. Yeah, yeah. This is a good, as good as it gets, guys. So it's uh, it's fine. <laughs> we'll just we'll just yeah, we'll plug on through. So yeah, uh, bass guitar is my primary instrument, and um, when Max for Live came out in 2010. Um, that was a yeah really big deal for me because I was I had uh, kind of relinquished myself to trying to build a looping system in Max MSP, and I had you know gotten so far through that and then Max for Live came out and I decided well I don't have to deal with that anymore and uh, Max for Live gave me a lot of um, 
oper- the lot of new new power that uh, I didn't have with just Ableton on its own. Um, so the, the thing that's most interesting for me with regard to Max for Live is access to the live API. So I can do a bunch of things like um, automatically arming tracks, automatically selecting different tracks, um, automatically dragging and dropping things from one place to another um, without having to do a ton of mousing around. Um, so yeah, let me, uh, I guess I'll try to share my screen. Yeah, do it. Um, this is going to be very interesting because like live looping is sort of one of those things that, um, um, lots of people get enthusiastic about, um, but to develop it yourself is really tricky. Yeah. Like I said, so, it's so much work. Like <laughs> just the, these kits that these guys set up are, they're just so mind blowing. Like this is definitely, and, and that's the thing is it's going to always end up being tailored to whatever your tastes are and whatever you think a good um like workflow is so all my max for live stuff it doesn't i don't have any max for live plugins that make any noises necessarily it's all just hacks to optimize my workflow um so uh, i guess for example you guys can see my screen right yeah i see it yep okay cool um so you'll notice as i scroll through here i don't have any clips or anything i have very very few clips uh, I am not using any clips, so all the, the uh, audio I get is from either bass guitar or some samples that I had produced from uh, bass guitar. <clears throat> and I have my you know, Max for Live mods over here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this one right here, this, this is kind of a bank that I've mapped a couple of foot switches to. Um, it's just a central interface for all the loopers in the set. So I map my foot switches to this thing, and this will uh, control whichever looper is on the track that's currently selected. So all I have to do to switch things up is just select the new track. And I also have a uh, just an option in there that'll select the track for me as soon as the loop is captured. Um, so I think... Yeah, if I click this auto button and then just record a loop of my voice that I don't think is going to come out of the audio system. Yeah, you can see right there, it automatically selected that new track for me. Um, so I can keep on going like loop, loop, loop and, and have things refreshed pretty consistently over and over again for me. Um, so I don't have to do a lot of mousing around or buttoning around and all that good stuff. Um, from there, I don't know. This is probably not super well known. Um, you can, you know, do that drag and drop and loopers interface, drag it uh, into a clip slot, and you have the, the clip that you had just recorded in that looper. But you can also drag that uh, little drag me icon into an instance of Ableton Sampler and then start sequencing, resequencing that loop that you just captured on the fly. Um, and also, given that I don't really like, uh, don't really like mousing around, I have a, another little Max for Live hack that will drag and drop automatically for me. So if I just press one button, it just drags and drops that loop right into Sampler for me. Whoa! And I can start sequencing. That's that. awesome. That's yeah. That's pretty good. Right. Right. Big help for me. Definitely open that. That's definitely one of those things like, holy crap, that opens up a lot of possibilities for me right away. Um, yeah. Um, so, so like you're, you're actually really involved more with the API stuff. Yes. Big time. Um, yeah. That, that's also the most interesting part of Max for Live, in my opinion. Um, I know you guys do loads of stuff, uh, you know, building, building uh, drum machines and synths. A lot of really badass synths. Um, a lot of super cool, like, resampling. Uh, was it uh, Lucky 16? Did I, am I saying that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your collection. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, the, <laughs> loads of fun to play around with that. Um, so, yeah, I love the effects, but I love even more the fact that I can just hack Ableton itself. Um, get that going for me. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, in terms of actual hardware setup, it's pretty simple. 
just bass guitar into my audio interface, and then I am controlling uh, a bunch of different stuff with my APC40, uh, that first gen. Um, let's see. I'll try to. <laughs> I have some really awful, uh, awful uh, webcam <laughs> that maybe I'll try to switch to real quick. Just so y'all can see how ridiculous my APC40 is. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, this is very disorienting. <laughs> Let's go up. I'm okay. tripping. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It does add a nice uh, <laughs> sort of. It. Yeah, this is well tripping. It's it, it's adding something quite psychedelic yeah. to the experience. There we go. Is that doing? Is that doing it for you? And that's it, that's, man. That's yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm glad I dropped that acid. Yeah, very good. Hey, shh, you can't say that. No, sorry, but that was a joke. Cancelled. Cancelled. Uh, so yeah. I'll be, uh, <laughs> So yeah, like, um, because I so I've clearly been a little bit confused because I thought that you you'd built your own looper, but actually what you've done is you've actually just built a system to get Ableton to work kind of natively, I suppose, but in a way that that you can navigate it, um, I guess with just like your feet and stuff. Yeah. So you've yeah, right. that's a, a a big help for me because I didn't want to have some really elaborate foot switch set up where I was like banking through presets or, you know, God forbid needing to have like 12 foot switches just for one button for each of my individual loopers. So if I could just have two foot switches and they'll dynamically remap themselves to whatever looper happens to be selected, that really optimizes my workflow for me right away and, and kind of takes care of some problems. Um, yeah. So what about base processing? What, what, oh. How do you yeah. handle that? Because you said you're just going straight into the audio interface. Yep. So let's, uh, let me try to share my screen again. Oh, <laughs> sorry, guys. All right. So, uh, yeah, what happens there? Um, bass guitar right into my interface and right into this uh, first track. Uh, this, this group track called live um so any any sort of live feed will go into that group track um bass guitar muted right now clearly i'm going in through my mic but um if the bass were plugged in you'd see it you know lighting up this channel strip right here and from there it, it gets you know uh, plugged into these individual looper tracks so i have another max for live hack that will automatically disarm the previously selected track while arming the currently selected track. Um, and with that like looper optimization that will select the next track for me as soon as my loop is captured, um, that there, there's like a lot of automation there that I now don't have to worry about clicking a bunch of buttons just to set up my next looper um, or doing any of that, doing anything that just sucks. <laughs> Mousing around is, such a drag and uh yeah I, I i have so many so many little you know max for live hacks that all they do is eliminate any possibility of me having a mouse around too much um and that also really plays into the kind of keeping the performance uh more uh, a little more interesting for me because uh, the only one of the only downfalls of looping is how quickly um like an idea will start to expire in terms of how interesting it is to listen to. Like it just starts, it's like that produce that's in your fridge for too long. You buy that spinach and there it goes. Um, so you, you gather that loop and 32 bars later, it's, it's not super interesting to listen to anymore and things start to get a little boring. Um, uh, so one of the ways I, I freshen up a captured loop is A, doing that uh, kind of automated drag and drop that I just demonstrated. 
B also uh, Max for Lives buffer shuffler. I absolutely love buffer shuffler. So what buffer shuffler does is it will take um, it, will, it will populate a, a larger buffer audio buffer with whatever audio is coming into it. So I think it's like re-recording into this audio buffer constantly. What you can do then is rearrange individual chunks of the buffer. So you can you can take this one. Essentially, what will happen is you'll take, say, a one bar loop, be able to split it up into 16th notes on the fly, and then rearrange them in time and um, loads of different ways. And uh, that that is a really great way to <laughs> freshen up the sound. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, fantastic. About any of that? Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a question for you about live looping. Yes. Especially like as you're sort of, um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of coming up with the ideas yourself with the instrument and you're also executing the process of not only performing it, but looping it. What do you do in those moments where you play something and it's just awful and you're like, oh no. Oh, I, I like how this, this is going to be, uh, I think this is a great common theme um, so far throughout this, this you know, get together meeting of the minds, because that is a really important function to have <laughs> um, when things start to suck. Um, for a while, for many years, I was really, really good at clearing a room, um, just making sure people left uh, within five minutes of my performance starting. Uh, so because I didn't really have that functionality, uh, wrapped up in my mind. Um, so what I used to do was just to pretend like <laughs> this is on purpose. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever you're hearing, I, I meant to do that. Yeah. Um, now uh, what I can do is I, I have like a looper on the master track, which if, you know, I'll set it to like one bar or something like that, capture that one bar, um, let that go while I clean up a bunch of like clear a bunch of loopers uh, or clear loopers that I might not be sure what might have gone into them um, and just kind of scale back. And from there, I'll, I'll probably like modulate the length of the loop on the master track, uh, the pitch of it, uh, take it to that like kind of build up kind of thing and then drop it out. And then I'm, I'm suddenly back in a territory that was used to be the familiar thing. Um, so that's, that's the way I'm approaching. That's the way I'm approaching the oh shit switch right now. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, like, so in those moments when, when you've maybe done something that you're not happy with, you keep going with it anyway, and then sort of turn it into something that can work for you. It's not like yeah. that you have an undo switch or you go stop, stop and start again, or there's like, there's still something that you can do to kind of recover it and turn it into something that's palatable for you. Yeah. I'll still, I'll still, uh, I guess, philosophically lean into it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think that the, the idea of going forward, ever forward, <laughs> um, I start in one place and I end up in a completely different place is kind of what I'm, what I want to do performance wise. Yeah. Fantastic. So other than, um, than more kicks and friends, where can I link people to go and check out what you're doing? Oh, uh, I have, so I have a bunch of max for live stuff on my website, deferlo.com. Um, the la here I, I'm an Austin, Texas based artist. Uh, I uh, will play shows with, uh, and also do uh, Max for Live workshops at a small school called Dada Geek, D A D A G E E K dot com. Um, and if you're in, they also do you know, streaming classes worldwide. Um, they'll do classes on, you know, Ableton, Arduino. They're, um, I think, uh, uh, Blender was one of the classes that they took some like animation programs and stuff like that. Um, so really cool classes um, if you're looking to get into this kind of stuff that we're all talking about. Um, Data Geek. Um, that's with uh, that's with Pulse Coder, right? Yes. Yep. Who was also on More Kicks and Friends. Yes. I it's all coming that. together. Yep. <laughs> cool. And so, what are you? What What are your plans now? What's have you got any shows coming up, or what's I've, in the pipeline? Uh, 
I oh so I I am slowly but surely finally finishing up a little five track EP um, with a bunch of finally finishing like tracks that were on, it's a little embarrassing but there's two tracks on there that are now I've been working on on and off for a decade um, so this is going to be like kind of like a culmination little five track EP I've been working on this crap for way too long. I think it's done now. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Yep, yep. That'll be coming out. Um, uh, there's no date, but I'm really hoping by like the end of the summer. Um, so we'll see. We'll see about all that. Cool, man. Yeah. Anyone um, got any questions? Yeah, I've got Anyone? a question for uh, Nate. Um, so how many sort of loops would you feel comfortable manipulating in, in a live context? Uh, I I really don't go too far beyond uh, five, four or five. I've done eight, but I keep scaling back. Um, so when I first started designing this this little system that I'm using, I wanted to naturally pump as much functionality into it as possible. Um, and now that I've kind of realized how feature happy I got <laughs> over the years, I've I've scaled back a lot. So. Right now, my most recent performance at Data Geek a couple weeks ago, I think I was just only using, uh, yeah, five loopers. Um, and uh, the, you know, I'll, I'll I'll definitely overdub into them. Um, if you're familiar with Ableton's looper, there's you know some more ways of freshening it up. You can have a looper. There's a toggle switch that will let you play the loop in reverse. You can modify the length and the pitch of the loop. Um, so there's, you know, a bunch of options within that one Ableton looper um, for, for keeping things fresh. It's an interesting idea because I know there's quite a lot of people experimenting with like modular and loopers, which seems like a really obvious That's, fit, although not, yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm not seeing many people doing it that well. Um, maybe your Max for Live patches could work well for that. It'd be worth okay. trying. Yeah, okay. That's, it's definitely super fertile ground. Um, like what uh, Ned was saying about how this is all very much in its infancy. Mm. Um, we're, and I think we've all definitely felt that, especially starting um, and not knowing exactly how to, how to pare down all the possibilities into something that actually works for you um, and with you. Where did you get into, um, you say bass is your primary instrument. What, yes, have you played that all your life? Or how did you get into playing bass? Uh, I started, uh, so I, I took piano lessons as a kid. Um, I've always been, you know, pretty involved in music. Um, and I played, uh, still kind of play trumpet. Um, and, you know, naturally I picked up the guitar. So I kind of switched to bass out of, guitar was never that comfortable. Um, I, I, I picked up a bass and it felt a lot more natural. I think I was 16 when I, when I got a bass. And the idea of like really fat, thicker strings that I can, you know, play with just my hands made a lot more sense uh, physically. Well, that's cool stuff. Like the, do you, I haven't heard any of your uh, tracks yet. Are you building up your percussion layers with the bass as well? Like tapping on pickups and things. Yeah. Is that what you do? You build up literally everything is the bass. Yep. Um, Although uh, right now, so I have a bunch of drum racks and most of the kits in there are just simple, very like eight sample kits. Mm. Um, and a lot of that I've, I've pared down from just massive recording sessions. So I, I have a pedal board. I also don't drag it out live because I just think it's a massive pain in the ass. Um, mm. So I've stopped doing that. Um, but when I'm home, uh, if, if I have any pedals that have like a MIDI input, um, that, that's, that's a really good time for me to design like a Max for Live sequencer for like a delay pedal that happens to have a MIDI input. And then I'll just sit at home and make noises with the bass and just record all of that. And from there I can uh, start doing some sample gathering. Um, and I also have a field recorder that uh, I'll sometimes use stuff that I've captured on there to, to, to build up some drum racks. That sounds awesome. I love love the approach. Thank you. What kind of bass are you using? Is it a Warwick or is it an it's, Ibanez? 
It's not. It's an Ibanez. Oh. I know. I know. I, I guess. I, I win. Wanna... Guess the base. <laughs> <laughs> I understand if you want to kick me out now. No, 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 no. I, I, I no, no. Ibanez are brilliant. Nothing wrong with Ibanez. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm always lusting after Ibanez. As, I mean, they actually make because I'm a lefty, so they actually make nice lefty oh. bases. Mm. No kidding. Yeah, and they, they, they do quite a nice six string. I've always quite, quite liked. And they're practically indestructible. I've got an Ibanez in the corner here, and I do not treat it well, and yet it <laughs> plays perfectly. Yeah, I think I have. So I grab it real quick. It's up on the wall. Uh, kind of like that that it's not wood it's made of that like pressed paper or something like that that luthite whatever it's called it's um, like particle board or something What's yeah that? right right um and this i got this when i was 17 and i'm 37 now and likewise i've i've not been <laughs> the, the the best at keeping this instrument as well as i could be but it's I'm, i don't think i'm ever going to have a real reason to get rid of it so definitely going to keep it up what's the um what's like the action like on it is it quite are you quite a low action person I am, or i am a low action person yeah um and i'm not i'm not super uh like i don't i find fret buzzing to be a pleasing noise so. I, I quite like it too there's a yeah. there's a time and a place for it where it's like especially with a, with a, the right bit of distortion right it can kind of come out, it sort of adds something. Obviously, you don't want it everywhere. No, no, for sure. I've, I've got a guitar that's got a bit of fret buzz on the open G string. And I'm every time I play a G, I'm like, oh, <laughs> sounds like a sitar. <laughs> Fantastic. You, Obviously. Know, you get a little wah going, you can kind of massage some overtones out of that and make some <laughs> pretty interesting textures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so any more questions? I had a question, uh, Nathan. If like you mentioned about um, like loops getting boring after like thirty-two bars or something like that, yeah. and like so, do you ever feel? Do you ever feel like you're actually present in what's happening, or that you're just worried about what you need to do next to uh, kind of keep it compelling? And, and do you just like, once the loop's kind of running and you feel like, do you, you then just let, improvise over the top of it a bit to kind yes. of... Can I, can I embellish that question slightly? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, is there like a line that you're riding between I'm in the zone and I'm panicking? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly right. That's exactly it. Um, and no, I'll be, I'll be honest. Like I'm panicking right now doing this. So <laughs> my performances are are like, I don't know, 85% panic. Um, and then like 15%, like, all right, I'm, I'm fucking in it. Um, mm. but luckily I've gotten to the point where I've done so much development and so much practicing that I know I can calm down a little bit. I know what I'm doing mm -hmm. works. Um, and it's nice when you, when, when you do get to that, like 15% where you're like, Oh, I'm nailing it. And then you're like hearing, people like hoot and holler mm -hmm. at the bar and that good stuff and you've got you've got to do the room clearing gigs to get to that point oh, haven't you god. really you know yep. that's the oh my god dude. it all leads there doesn't it eventually but yeah yeah i've 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 fiery champion of clearing a room <laughs> for a long long time <laughs> yeah but like but, but but when you're finished you don't feel like even though you might be in a kind of state of panic whilst you're doing it you don't come away feeling like Oh, what have I? Why did I do that? You, I, no, you, you come no, away yeah. feeling like, yeah, that was right. good. Yeah, you're always satisfied. Like it always gives you enough to just keep on playing. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, was, I, I, I personally cool. think it's incredibly brave. Like I've tried to do it a couple of times, and I'm just like, no. I've tried like all kinds of systems. Like you know, there's, I, I think maybe there's sort of part of us that kind of wants to be able to 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 turn up at something, and to to be able to just go. And it come out being like really, really, really good. And I know at certain points I've tried to develop something and I probably still will. Like I've tried to develop something where it's like, I'm just going to turn up with a whole bunch of stuff and I'm just going to start. And then it's just going to go from there. And whenever I've tried, it's just been awful <laughs> because I think it's like, like I say, there's a bravery there. There's like a, sort of, a certain confidence and, you know, whilst I'm happy to do it, say perhaps with like um, a bunch of like random musicians, 
uh, in a kind of free jam thing, that's like very different. But to do it with technology, there's just something like, no, I can't. I, I, it's not that I don't trust the technology. I don't trust myself to use it <laughs> properly, yeah. even though I've spent all this time sort of developing it. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've always got um, admiration for people who, uh, who, um, who pull it off. It's, You've got uh, to better improvise though, right? Because we've had, mm -hmm. when I was playing in bands and you'd have the, the keyboard player in our band, he, he, he didn't look after his equipment well and he had sort of bits of cigarette packets sort of jammed under a circuit board and he would say, oh, it's fine. And it would always work in rehearsals, but then it had, he had a knack of it not working when it got on stage. And then we were playing some, some reasonable gigs in London, like the Jazz Cafe, and the, it, the whole kit just cuts out. And then my bass player and I would be left there and then just start playing something that we were practicing or some riff from, because literally everything would go down. Like, and we would just start be jamming there for certain, people don't tend to notice. We would just, as long as you look like you know what you're right. doing. Just and it's just, but, you know, it's that, as you were saying, it's that terror. You're thinking, I am, I am just terrified, but they, I'm trying they to can like smell your fear, can't they? The audience can smell. The audience can immediately notice if you're yeah. like, as if because if you look like it's gone to shit, it will go to shit. Like you could ju just like as soon as you look scared, they get scared yeah. as well. Yeah, you're, you're in charge. You're in charge. Someone. They're like horses. Sharpening a knife. Yeah. <laughs> Shake, uh, they're, they're just checking their phone. They're not, they're not out for me. The, yeah. One of the classic ones I saw, a guy who was playing our band, and he was, he was actually the second guitarist. And then sort of about a third of the way through the set, all I could see him on the stage, standing with his plug, with no plug on it, just sort of going, <laughs> looking like a ripe donut. Just, uh, just like, don't do that. Just go and like smash up your guitar or something. Just yeah, don't, yeah. Like, <laughs> don't let them know. It's a magic trick, isn't don't it? Don't give don't the game know. away. You don't give the game away, no. <laughs> Um, I need to have a piss, so I'm delegating Alan and Alex to host whilst I'm away. Oh, the responsibility is high. Hi, um, everyone. Well, if you've just joined us, this is uh, Compress It Like an Idiot. And Ned's just gone to the toilet. It's me and Alan, aka Broken Semitone, holding court. And we are, what now, two hours into a set, and we've had some excellent um, breakdowns. We've, we're covering some live looping and some... Uh, uh, some jungle master classes as well as um, some uh, modular sort of modular exceptionalism. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so Nate, is this something, the modular thing something that interests you as well? There's a lot, there's, we've heard a lot about modular today. Is that sounds like you could sort of incorporate some of that, given you're very technical with the, the Max for Live patches. I can imagine you'd take to that quite well. There's a, um, to get more specific about it, um, there is a Max for Live sequencer that was part of kind of the original package. Um, it's, a, it's part of some Ableton pack called the Big Three. Um, and it's this, you know, polyphonic multi-layer step sequencer um, where every, every MIDI event is weighted with a probability. Um, so I really enjoy messing around with that stuff big time. Um, and moreover to that modular thing, I did... Uh, so I did buy the full version of BCB Rack um, just because that's that's one thing that consistently interests me is uh, I don't care for sequencing on a MIDI timeline. Um, I would rather have uh, circular sequencers or step sequencers. And I, I have this idea and I'm just, I, I suppose I just want to confirm that with this VCV rack license, it feels like I have a, a massive world of sequencing potential. Yeah, there's there's lots stuff. of crazy sequencer in there. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm super interested in. Like, get VCV rack to now be my main sequencers, and, and Ableton will give me my loopers and my samplers and all that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully, <laughs> I'll, I'll get some good stuff going soon. I think there's definitely room for, I think with the, the, the whole modular thing, there's definitely room for the next type of interface. I think part of the lure of that type of approach is you can build your own sequencing approach. And I've tried many, many different approaches, but it always feels like there's the ultimate dashboard that you could do with this stuff. Like, I mean, the idea, you mentioned cyclic sort of sequencing, but there's all and ways of being able to create some kind of predictability around that, but we're also bound to bring it back as well. I still haven't seen the ultimate sequence and i still think that's something right. that so, so maybe it happens you know v, vcv would be a great place to try and you know prototype something like that i think it'll, it'll probably uh, end up being I, i'd say that the 
uh, being a big modular user, uh, the ultimate sequencer is usually more than one at the same time. Like yeah. one sequencing another one, sequencing another one, uh, not uh -huh. necessarily being all on the same timing. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. using like chain sequences like this, you end up having a, like crazy power over lots of different uh, parameters that you like, not necessarily nodes. And it's usually what makes like awesome sequences happen just at the touch of a few faders or switches or stuff. Yeah, definitely having like there's there's a couple of guys that use online. I think um, Milo Melodies was one of the guys who was I learned a lot from. I guess if you're a modular guy, you must you must have watched his videos. But the idea of having two sequences and then having cr triggering gates independently, so you've got a decoupled approach to sequencing uh, but you can actually yeah, bring yeah. things back to you can get quite a lot of complexity with very s simple tools and i guess that's the modular thing right is this sure. once you start to understand what's going mm -hmm. on you're like well actually you can you can do a lot that's back we're, I, we're actually, we're back, actually yeah thank god we're for that yeah we're destroying your brand yeah here, we shut down the, sure. we're no longer live <laughs> we're no longer live if we went everyone's there. gone I'm sure you did a very good job. Uh, well done. Um, I took my glasses off, and, but I want to read some comments here. Uh, let's see what we've got here. 90, uh, sounds like the Ultra Track. 90% panic with the Ultra Track. Um, yeah, I'm not confident enough to do a gig with the Ultra Track yet because it's 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 kind of one of those things where you you can kind of get lost, and the only thing that you can do is to press stop. <laughs> <laughs> and take a minute to go all right where am i so even though i've had it for years i'm still navigating it uh my rack on ipad yeah that's um that's kind of vcv rack for the ipad i think something quite similar don't know if it's the same developer or something um yeah cool well everyone's tuning in and hanging out that's nice um well, Nathan, thank you very much for uh, your time and sharing sharing your yeah. shit. Um, we've got you, to get man. you next time. I do it more kicks and friends. You have got to come back on and oh, do yeah. another one because yeah. uh, sure. I want to I want to relive the excitement of that first episode where I sort of said, "Oh, it's just, everyone just send me some stuff," and then they all did, and it was all really good. And yeah. I was like, "I can't believe everyone's actually done this." Right. <laughs> I, I was kind of thinking oh i'm bored i'll just you know but then it like you you know and um you it was an exciting when time you might tackle that how like when oh when uh oh, well i've definitely got to do we've definitely got to do another one i mean we did one we did one in march didn't we yeah. um yeah we've got to do another one like I, I i had plans to kind of uh travel around the world uh you know like phil collins at live aid yeah, yeah, we're and trying sort of, to put together for <laughs> we, we, we talked about you. You offered the um, you offered the uh, da uh, Dada Geeks venue as a uh, somewhere as a destination in Austin. Um, I I mean it's it's always going to be a possibility. Um, but yeah, I mean we'll definitely do a uh, an online one at some point. It would be really, re you know, since you're live looping and we've just been talking about. 85 percent panic it, it would be like amazing to, to, to pipe you in live and do it that was the that was the first idea i had was that i i'll pipe everyone in live and mm. it will just be like basically it'll be like live aid on youtube but i was like <laughs> no this is gonna this will be like this will be a disaster but um i'm still open to trying it one day does that make you bob geldof then <laughs> I will be, well, give us your fucking money <laughs> thatcher <laughs> Sorry, British cancelled. people might get that cancelled. joke. Cancelled. I'm not going to get cancelled for a Thatcher joke. <laughs> I'm joking, man. Oh, Bob Bell's in the chat. Bob uh, did the uh, thumbnail artwork for this show. Hi, Bob. Um, oh. Yeah, Nathan, thank you very much for... Uh, um, thank you, man. Uh, yeah, by all means, uh, continue hanging out with us. Let's, uh, let's move on to Damien. Damien, you've been sitting there quietly looking like you've been trying to protect your identity with those sunglasses on. <laughs> something like that so yeah i mean this uh, um also just uh there are a couple of um uh notes in the chat about the uh the microphone problems we apologize this is all very new to all of us especially me um I, i'm much used to normally just doing this by myself 
but um, I've invited loads of other people on with all kinds of different types of equipment and different setups and stuff. It's tricky to uh, maintain a consistent broadcast level, but we will <laughs> learn. We'll learn from these little trips. Um, Turismo Blue. Right, mate. What up, what up? So, so you, but, oh, go God, ahead. no, 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 no. Oh, you, you first. You, oh, no, no, you, please. <laughs> I was going to say, my setup is very similar to Stasma's. Um, we use obviously some different hardware, but it's 808, 303 clones, and then um, <clears throat> live choppage on MIDI controllers. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that. Uh, but what were you going to say, Ned, before I rudely interrupted? I was going to say that you've been on more kicks than friends more than anyone else. Actually, I forgot to mention that Chelsea was on, I think, maybe two or three times. But you've been on about a hundred times <laughs> something i think every one except for number one and i'm not sure if i was on the one that stasma was on i don't think so i remember just watching that one and not having any sort of anxiety about my set were you not on number i thought you were on number one I was on number two? Oh yeah you were yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i remember the cats yeah <laughs> um yeah, so, I mean, but you, you're kind of like sort of, um, whilst probably most of us know Turismo Blue quite well, you're actually kind of chopping and changing your approach to live stuff quite regularly when we chat. You know, you're doing ambient shows, um, yeah. kind of approaching it a whole different way, but like you're, you know, pretty concerned with it being live and off the cuff. and Yeah, um, you know, I when it comes to, you know, I'll pull it up. I use uh, the Behringer RD8. It was the cheapest drum machine I could get with individual outs at the time. I'm not sure if that's changed. I really don't care for it. This is not a sales pitch for an RD8. In fact, do not buy one. I cannot <laughs> not recommend it highly enough. It's awful, but it gets the job done. I programmed some sequences on there. I used to do it totally on the fly, but they updated the firmware after they released it, and it makes it nowhere near as easy to do that. But that firmware update does fix it from freezing and dying when it gets MIDI signals. I actually bricked my first one. It would, whenever it got MIDI, it, the tempo would drift into eventually just freeze. And then one day it froze and never unfroze or never turned back on. Uh, luckily, uh, Sweetwater sent me another one. Um, but this was, the Behringer, or no, sorry, Roland TB03. This was my first 303 clone I got. Um, and I fell in love with the sequencer, but these things are not built well at all, and almost none of these knobs work anymore. Do not buy this either. <laughs> now I use. This is, uh, this is like oh, the oh, anti advert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not coming here to steal anything. I'm telling you what. There's going to be a shit email in your inbox tomorrow morning. We are absolutely not sponsored by any of these companies. If you come to my inbox, we'll show down, brother. Um, (laughs) Fuck that, dude. But uh, I bought this one cheap off of someone who couldn't figure it out. This is the Behringer uh, TD3, and this is much more solid than the Roland one. And uh, I don't think you can program this on the fly, so I usually will make up about seven different patterns I can go through. Um, so I've got some different vibes. I usually only end up about three of them before I switch to something else. And I'll kind of show that in my set. Um, and something else I always, always use for my 303s is this Moog, Moog, Mog, uh, MF Boost. It's just a very squeaky clean boost. I turn every knob all the way up. And when you're adjusting the resonance on a 303, you start to lose volume. It's very high volume at low resonance, but it starts to lose volume the higher you get. What the boost pedal does is it sort of just makes it level. Everything is equally as loud, and it adds a little bit of heat is the best way I can put it. The sound just sounds hotter without being distorted. Maybe it is slightly distorted, but it's just a very clean boost. That's why I use this one. I've tried, uh, I've gotten Earthquaker boost pedal as well, but it's just not as transparent, so I don't often use that. Um, here, I will share my screen so we can check out what I've been doing. I sort of remade what I was doing for, uh, more kicks and friends. I have changed this up a little bit in recent times as I learn. So the orange group is what I want for my RD eight. 
just a really simple I'm gonna drum bus it like an idiot whack the transients up a little bit a little bit of drive and crunch uh, uh, Julian can we hear your fan like I think your fan might be on if you could mute your mic or something is that I think it's, I think it's my fan oh <laughs> ah right oh shit yeah. it's like 92 fan degrees base. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, I only do this for when I'm doing streams on the internet or things for social media. I take out just the low frequencies below about human hearing, usually about 30 hertz, just to clean it up. In a club setting, I would probably leave that since you can really feel it. But a lot of people are just listening on their phones or their laptop speakers. Um, and you're really not getting any of that. Same thing with the highest highs I take out just above human range of hearing. Um, and then from 303, very simple. I just saturate it. Um, gives it a bit bigger, fatter sound. And then I take away the sub frequencies because I want that booming 808 kick drum. Uh, and then I'll usually put those both through some sends. I always have these effects on. <clears throat> First one's a hybrid, or a hybrid reverb, but just on the spring reverb setting. I love spring yeah. reverb. I used to put everything um, through, I have an old 16 channel sun mixing board, which has a huge spring reverb tank. And when I moved to more modern gear, uh, I was missing that spring reverb. So this was the closest I could get um, without sampling that old spring reverb, which I want to do. And then I've got something I call a warehouse or delay, which is just a filtered delay, a ping pong delay. And uh, that just kind of widens up the 303 and it makes it kind of sound like things are bouncing off the walls. I always uh, have a sort of dub echo delay on as well. Um, I use that sometimes. And then something I do, well, I didn't load it on here because I used to not do this for more kicks than friends. I'll put a pitch shifting delay, the new Ableton shifter with a ton of feedback. Um, so it'll kind of do its own sort of thing that will that would be this D channel, but I was trying to keep it to what I would just use for more kicks and friends. I don't have my mixer hooked up right now, so I just recorded some loops. This is what it would sound like. Without the drum bus, it does not have that kick at all. So I usually, especially when you're watching the more kicks than friends, I'd start off with a more uh, techno or electro sort of thing working on my hardware. Uh, playing around with that and then I shift into more of the break core side of things um, Normally when I'm playing like live in person, I would either do one or the other um, But something that's really cool about playing on the internet Especially if you're pre-recording is that you can do stuff you wouldn't be able to do live or have some cool transitions and whatnot uh, so let me stop that and then move over to this device which is sort of like a five-in-one instrument rack. So I can play notes on the keyboard and it sends various MIDI notes into a drum break, uh, a sub bass, a sort of pad sound, and then a 303 sort of chop. Um, it's got all sorts of arpeggiation going on and note lengths to keep everything in time and send different lengths of things into there. And each um, chain itself has got more random aspects I really wanted to try and make something that I was playing with the computer. I don't have total control. The computer sort of has somewhat control and I don't know what's exactly what's gonna happen. Like when I start pressing keys. Just sort of along for the ride. I know generally in groups of about an octave what's going to happen. So just the high octave, it's going to be sort of 
This is basically going to be a nice lead, and there might be some of that in there. Down lower is going to be the acid and the brakes for sure. But after everything gets a little bit too crazy and chaotic, I've got, I mentioned this earlier, sort of an oh shit switch. I use Tornado a lot. Um, I won't open it right now, but I've got various sliders on my MIDI keyboard mapped to different things uh, on Tornado, so it starts going in a way I don't like. I just tend to do this sort of nothingness. And then when I'm ready, I can bring it back. Another thing I use a lot is uh, Ned Rush's Nobulator. It's an old Max for uh, live device. Um, just got a bunch of different effects on there, and I've got these mapped to various knobs. Come on now. And then the sort of other thing I do is, if you're a Ned Rush regular, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, this is the Circa 97 version of the Circa 96 drum rack. Um, in this instance, every different key on my MIDI keyboard is a different slice of a break or a different note and whatnot. Um, and this is where I've got a little bit more control and I'd like to go ham. I usually end with this because I get pretty into it. Come on now. There we go. don't use exactly this one I'll customize it depending on the show I'm doing but I wanted to pull in the exact one that you can get for patreon if you subscribe to patreon Ned Rush's patreon <laughs> thanks mate you exactly what it does <laughs> Damien what about your oh shit switch if you are you going to cover that as well yeah oh, that's tornado ask. that's yeah. that's tornado um it, not always be tornado. It, it's sometimes different different effects. Sometimes it's just a I'll use this echo and send everything into the echo, so I just get a long echo going while I'm working on it. But uh, here, that's sort of the oh shit switch. Yeah. And when I'm ready, I bring it back. Yeah, yeah tornado's really. Uh... I, I kind of use Tornado for something quite similar, actually. Like, just, just to sort of create a huge mush that I can just leave running. But also kind of because of the dynamic processing in uh, in Tornado, where, like, the order of the effects chains is determined by the order in which you instantiate them with the, with the knobs and stuff, you can actually kind of find some interesting sort of, like, um, sweet spots whilst you're kind of doing that shit switch thing. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean, it's like, oh, okay, I've sort of I've turned all the effects on in this combination. The finger does something quite similar, but you have to do it with MIDI. Yeah, and um, yeah, you can sort of find these like little kind of like uh, weird kind of um, drones that you can sort of still kind of move around in whilst you're getting ready to do the next thing. Um, yeah, Tornado is great for that. Amy, I'm fairly certain, that maybe although I was really drunk on the recent one that we did, that you yeah. you had, I'm pretty sure you had the controller on your head at some point. Was oh yeah, I was going to pull that out. So <laughs> I use um, this little APC Key 25 um, a lot of times when I want to sort of put it behind my head. Because it's quantized, it's somewhat easy to keep going and 
you know, a lot of people mentioned the sunglasses in the chat. Uh, my eyes are super sensitive to light and I'm focusing a lot of times. Anyone, what I'm doing, so my eyes are closed. I sort of put the blast shield down and let the force flow through. So <laughs> I think that in front of me, I'm not looking at what I'm doing. I know that this is my, you know, first three hits and over here is my base. So when I put it behind my head, I can still feel what's going on and keep the beat going. It's a little bit harder since you aren't seeing it and it's a little bit awkward, but um, the quantize it helps and then doing it enough, especially with your eyes closed, you can just get a feel. And then I'll usually put it behind my head, get going for a minute, get it so it's loop, doing something that's looping, point, put it back in front and then go back to it. Can I ask a question? No. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> How can you see out of those glasses? Well, I, not really. But like I said, I'm usually closing my eyes, so I'm not... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, great stuff. I, truly... I really like it. <laughs> the, I, was, the, I, was, the way, uh, I love it. I was getting more kicks than friends flashbacks. Whilst that during that little demonstration, uh, I see Combat Recordings has just joined in the chat. Hello, mate. Big ups. Um, yeah. Anyone else got any more questions for Damien about? I anything? don't have questions, but can you just say, like, I can't stop smiling when you when you played that shit. Like, it was, <laughs> it was, thank you. Like, really amazing to me. But I just, I'm just thinking, like, 16 year old me would just probably explode. <laughs> it sounds like completely awesome to me like crazy stuff. so uh stasma alluded to this uh, i come from a punk and metal background as well and when i got to electronic music it's like man this sounds cool but there's not that energy for me so when i was able to find stuff that's just like rip tearing and then i can go absolutely crazy with it it, it puts me back and i feel like um the dance pit could or the dance floor could turn into a mosh pit and then i'd feel right at home that's what I'm going for. I, I yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, did I cut someone off? No. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so you mix, you're mixing the hardware into live with some processing plus your playing. Yeah. Isn't it a mess with the clocks and stuff? Don't, don't you have syncing problems or things like this? No, I go uh, out of my MIDI controller, MIDI syncs everything else. So when I press play here, um it starts playing uh my hardware it's yeah. it's a little bit of latency but um it's not usually enough to be noticeable and okay. then uh usually what i'll do as i get into the more crazy uh choppage stuff is i'll record just a like a couple bars of like the 303 i usually will turn the 808 off um because i don't want any competing beats but yeah. then i'll just have that loop of the 303 going because Ableton will automatically time sync it, it's a little bit off, but if anything, it just sounds a little syncopated. Um, yeah. oh, it's okay. I don't have too big an issue with it. It's, it's really a question because I, I, I've kind of stopped, uh, even in the studio, to do mm -hmm. both at the same time because I'm always annoyed by how oh, there's always something that's not syncing properly, basically. But I guess because I haven't took that enough time to sync everything. But uh, yeah, for, for the hardware set, for example, I only use DinSync. I've stopped using MIDI because I, even just with MIDI, I've, I always have problems. So that, that's one of the things that I have done size it, the, the repetitor setup. Mm -hmm. I have only MIDI and analog sync. Uh, I mean, DinSync and analog clocks and stuff. So I know that everything is in time all the time. And uh, it, yeah, it's fun. With MIDI, I always have problems. Always. I, I yeah. know it's different for everyone, so I don't know where, where it comes from. It's, it's I'm also cool. using a lot newer gear. Um, this yeah. stuff just came out a couple of years ago. Your XOX yeah. box and 808 clone are a little bit older and handmade. So who, know, who knows if the MIDI they put in the MIDI just a little bit wrong or something. Like, I'm not saying that, but, you know, who knows. If I did, I did have some MIDI issues with some other bits of gear, but I haven't with these two bits of gear. Um, yeah. And while I don't recommend people buy them, that's why I continue to use them until I find a suitable replacement. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you those others don't have the best MIDI implementation for sure. Yeah, I guess the Soxbox actually is pretty good, but the Yocto is a 
even even the din sync of the yokto when i use it as a master i can mm -hmm. feel sometimes the tempo is being like Ooh. so now i'm using the sauce box as the master when i do live with hardware because it's more steady totally and he, yeah i alluded to that when i first got the rda it had midi drift problems where the tempo would go up and yeah. down and you could definitely notice it and then um if it wasn't the master something else is sending midi to it it would get really bad and that's how it froze and died they made a, a firmware update that fixed that but it changed the user interface so i don't like it as much they did recently release a mark ii of the rda which supposedly fixes a lot of problems but i'm not fucking buying it sorry ned for swearing yeah but it's second hand There's, if you want to buy it you know, yeah right second. i'll wait for someone else to get sick. <laughs> that's what i did with this, because I was sick of Behringer's bullshit with the RDA, I was like, this looks really cool. I'm going to wait for one of these to come up used. Someone bought it brand new and could not figure out how to use it and put it up for sale. And I was like, oh, I'm getting that now. Good. All good with me. I definitely uh, also want to uh, uh, just express my, my, my gratitude and enthusiasm for people who put in the setup time to give themselves the freedom to really freak out on controllerism and their performance. Cause I, I, I very much firmly believe that that button mashing is a very authentic expression <laughs> of the human soul. It's yeah. a ton of yeah. To yes. yeah. Let's me put my mortal combat skills to actual use in public. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it sort of, it sort of makes perfect sense that um, like the arcade button thing made its way into the, the controllerist aesthetic. Yeah, totally. it, it really it just it's it's the absolute logical way to go because um and that's something that I've sort of thought looked quite nice about the MIDI fighter was that I'm I'm guessing that the 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 response from the buttons is just on or off. There's like no velocity, is there? No, yeah, there's no velocity. But, yeah. but and sometimes you just want that. You just want to hit a button and just get a thing to happen, and you don't want to have to worry about all these other things in between. But also th those things that they're so precise that you can see there's some people on videos that are using like three fingers and be like brr, 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 brr. it's it's so uh that you can trigger it by just uh yeah with a very soft touch you already triggering it and yeah it's those are really good i'm not i'm not as good as those guys i, I couldn't do it but uh, see uh, like quantized is the way to go for me but uh yeah you can you can do some crazy stuff with this as it's very sensitive doesn't have the velocity but it has that that yeah feeling those also have the um, i use it quite a lot actually live the, the gyroscope the one with the accelerometer yes. oh yeah no yeah the, but yeah the the gyroscopic acceler accelerometer yeah. uh, actually i i use like what one axis as the mod wheel for the uh, the finger fx so you can like increase some values while i'm just turning it to the public, basically, which makes yeah. it easy to notice, especially with drills, it's like, kink, kink. and it's always fun. <laughs> when people being like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't really, um, you, you don't really get that kind of, well, I, I mean, I've never, I've, I've never used one of those kind of arcade style things, but I can just see, just, just from seeing you do it just then, I can see what the response is like. And you're never yeah. going to get that response from like a MIDI keyboard or like, I mean, on the, on the Ableton push, like the, 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 the response from the pads is so good in terms of, of having a really, really big velocity curve. Like yeah. you can, you can really just tap them and just get a very soft sound or hit them really hard. There's loads of like feel to it, but sometimes you just, you really just want a button, you know, yeah. just to, just to do things. And, um, Yeah. Actually, that's kind of like um, that's kind of quite, what's quite nice about the electron boxes is that they have that kind of particularly yeah. on the Octa track. You, you, you push the button and it just does one thing, which is go, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. Well, anyone else got any more questions? Or yeah, do we have time for more questions though? I've got time. If you've got time, I'm happy. I'm here all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So. We discussed that, like this question of does the your setup shapes your music music or does your music shapes your setup? So I'm wondering if you have the same relationships with with your outfits you choose for your. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, uh, 
I usually just wear it's, turned it's up hats in my daily life. The show. Yeah, I usually just wear turned up hats in my daily life. I noticed I used to wear a, a red duff. Oh, I got it right here. Used yeah. to wear this one all the time, and people loved it because a lot of people are Simpsons fans. Um, the my record label that me and uh, or I'm sorry, it's not mine. The record label I'm on, along as well as Ned Rush, is called Acid Chicken, and they gave me this nice branded hat, so I wear that now. Uh, I started putting posting videos on Instagram, and uh, this company called Wasted Heroes gave me a bunch of T-shirts like this. So now I feel a little bit obliged to wear the various swag I've gotten from these different companies and whatnot. Yeah, uh, it makes it even better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do have some Western shirts I'll wear sometimes for a laugh or like a cowboy hat. Um, I did a video. Whenever I post a video and I'm pressing the cowbell, even once on the RD8, everyone just puts in the comments more cowbell. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make a video where I do nothing but go up there and press the motherfucking cowbell. And uh, I dressed up with a nice Western shirt and just pressed the cowbell. And yeah, that, I got that out of my system. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, I recently discovered your Instagram, like after the first, the uh, first post podcast we had. Okay. Yeah. And like, if there's one thing anyone could check it to check out is the freak on uh, post you made. I think it's from, oh yeah exactly from. So the that was uh, for more kicks and friends. That was yeah, more exactly. kicks and friends number two. I did a remix of Missy Elliott's "Get Your Freak On." Yeah. And I do bring that out uh, every now and then. Uh, fun fact: my litmus test to see if something's a banger, I take Missy Elliott's "Get Your Freak On" acapella, and I put that over it. And if it works, it's a banger. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great test. It was a pretty yeah. good chain back in the day. To be fair, yeah. back in no, the day, it's a great tune now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a classic, really. Isn't it? Timberland classic, Missy classic. Was it yeah. Timberland? I didn't know that. Yep. Yep. She shots yeah, they, had, they had a mix with Nella Furtado as well, which is I think so, yeah. Really good, yeah. I think Nelly Furtado's perhaps long since forgotten been forgotten. Not in my head, you know? Yeah. Oh, I know, I know, right. Still relevant up in here. I don't think I don't think she's uh, stood the test of time as much as uh, Missy Elliott. But then I, mean, I never thought it. Nelly Furtado would get mentioned on the Ned Rush YouTube channel. That's me new to me. <laughs> yeah, you can thank me later. So next time, next show, we're gonna it's gonna be a Nelly Furtado special. <laughs> I can't remember a single song she did. Oh, okay, now I remember. Yeah, the bird. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure, I could ask my dad for the CD. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we could have like an uh, like a, an early noughties like a uh, retrospective special and just uh, talk about music from the early noughties and uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm just riffing out some ideas. I'm I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. All right. Was well, that like like me, um, like me and Damien and Alan were talking about the '80s the other day? I was I was having my massive '80s rant, and I played you both Fisher Spooner, and I was very surprised to to hear that neither oh, yeah. of you had um, no. had heard of it. Not at all. Back in the the early noughties electro shock thing, when the '80s was suddenly starting to come back. Although we talked about how. Vice City had something to do with that as well. Yeah. But let's not get into that right now. That's yeah, can I plug lot. something before we move on, Ned? Sorry, say again? Uh, can I plug something before we move on? Yes. Uh, if you do want to get a hold of any of my music, uh, Bandcamp isn't the greatest place uh, for it right now. I have been usually putting my stuff out for other people or on other labels. So uh, check out Acid Chicken Records, uh, my recent cassette, as well as Ned's uh, recent album, Lager, Rinse, Repeat is out on there. Also check out Suck Puck Records. I put out an EP and you can find plenty of Stasma's music on there as well. I'm sure there's a couple compilations that have both me and Stasma on it. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the for the tracks of the new one, the next one for mastering, probably next week actually. Oh, so you've got a new one, new like EP coming out? All right. Yeah, uh, shout out Fats from uh, Suck Pucks. Awesome label. That was my bit. I've put your link tree in the YouTube. Awesome. Thank you. Not that like, I mean, everyone who's watched more kicks than friends must know, must know what, what, what you're up to by now. Yeah. If, uh, if you don't, I am working on some new been? stuff in a more like classic acid house vein. I, I've put out a lot of brick core. I wanted to do something 
a little bit more dancey. I still got, I still do plenty of that, but I feel like I've put out a lot of that over the past two years. So I wanted to put something more flowy out, a little bit more dancey. Uh, you have a you have an eight eight and a three three. You can do ten albums. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess this might be a good time to wrap it up. Although I'm quite happy to uh, hang out on this Zoom call if everyone else is. Um, but yeah, I guess we could wrap up the stream. What do you guys think? Sounds good. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of you for hanging out and to those of us who left a little early thank you for uh, hanging out with us and giving us your time uh yeah so this is compress it like an idiot this is a new thing i'm trying for youtube um i have no idea really what i'm doing but like uh, we're going to be doing more of these uh in the future so if anyone wants to get involved uh, get in touch and uh, yeah all right thanks everyone so how can i end this and make it really slick i guess i'll just hit end stream right now <laughs> okay everyone say goodbye bye. Bye. bye bye thanks everyone oh sam's just joined <laughs> <laughs> let's not end it just yet just as sam joins just, oh, sam, no. we are I literally missed. just about to end the stream Say goodbye, everyone, Sam. <laughs> We're going to end the Zoom call. We're just ending the stream. Oh, nice. All right, cool. I guess I made perfect timing. Hey, is Alex still here? No. No, he had to go. He's got an early start tomorrow. Oh, all right. Bummer. But uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end the stream. Okay, see you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> Later. Okay, I've ended the stream. Are you sure it says we're live?